during a Reform of Parliament conference with Tony Blair and other Labor Party members. That's America and the Courts, Saturday at 7, followed by American Perspectives at 8. Sunday evening, road to the White House at 6.30 and 9.30 Eastern and Pacific. Book notes with guest Michael Elliott at 8, and the people and politics of the United Kingdom at 9 Eastern and Pacific time. Next, drug use by federal employees. Earlier today, a House Oversight Subcommittee held a hearing on the issue. White House and drug enforcement officials are some of the witnesses. The hearing is chaired by Florida Congressman John Micah and runs about three hours. Good morning. I'd like to uh, call this meeting of the House Civil Service Subcommittee to uh, order. Uh, this morning, we're going to uh, have a hearing on the uh, drug-free workplace and talk specifically about uh, uh, standards in the highest office uh, in our land, uh, the White House. Um, we're going to uh, follow our usual procedure with opening statements. Um, I'll give mine and yield to the members as they uh, come in, and then we'll hear from our witnesses. But uh, today's hearing of the Civil Service Subcommittee has been called because testimony previously provided to this Congress outlined a deeply troubling failure by the current White House to safeguard against the employment of individuals with rec recent and historic patterns of drug use and abuse. This information was obtained in congressional hearings related to uh, the firing of the White House travel office employees and the abuse of the uh, FBI files by the current White House. This hearing is intended to accomplish uh, three purposes this morning. First, I think we need to reassure the American people that the abuses that we've learned about during the previous hearings did not, in fact, compromise our country's national security interests. Second, uh, I think we need to confirm that the White House has, in fact, instituted an effective uh, pattern for instituting corrective measures for deficiencies as identified in previous testimony that this subcommittee has uh, taken and the committee has taken. Uh, third, I want to evaluate whether legislation and uh, legislative action by Congress is appropriate and necessary to correct uh, any of these problems. How serious is the problem that was identified in previous uh, testimony? We must ask ourselves that question. Secret Service agent Jeff Underkoffer testified at the Committee on Government Reform and Oversight's July hearing that more than 30 of the background investigations that he had reviewed included references to, to previous drug abuse. He stated under oath, and I quote, I have seen cocaine usage, I have seen hallucinogenic usages, crack usages, uh, end quote. And he admitted that these were generally fairly uh, recent uh, use instances. FBI agent De uh, Dennis Scalambrini corroborated this, this testimony in a sworn deposition bef before our committee. He denied uh, that these background investigations reported merely experimental usage of marijuana in college by observing, and let me quote again, it was older people who had used illegal drugs much more recently, as recently as the inaugural, end quote. He described the drugs identified in these background investigations, inclu including cocaine and, again, I'll quote, designer drugs, and I'll quote again, hallucinogenic mushrooms, end quote. 
He repeated that this usage continued up to the inauguration. He contrasted the Clinton White House with previous administrations and emphasized, and again I'll quote, I don't know of a single person in this administration, regardless of drug use or any other thing that I was aware of, was terminated because of anything that came up on their FBI background investigations, end quote. Secret Service agent Arnold Cole testified that the White House and Secret Service negotiated a compromise to deal with this problem among employees already on the White House staff. The, comp the compromise was in fact the creation of a special drug testing program. Now, we're going to look today at what the White House has done to correct the, the uh, drug use problems that were identified uh, in the, uh, these backgrounds investigations. We need to know what they've done again to deal with the, this problem. The approval form that is sent from the Secret Service's White House pass section to the White House's Director of Personnel was revised. We've recently learned about this. The denial option on the Secret Service's form now has a paragraph that reads, and we've obtained a copy of it. Let me read this if I may and I'll quote uh, verbatim. The above listed individual is considered a potential threat to the President of the United States, the Vice President of the United States, and or the White House complex, complex, and therefore is not suitable for issuance of a permanent pass. If, however, the individual agrees to a biannual drug testing program above and beyond the mandatory applicant and random testing already required under the Executive Office of the President Drug Free Workplace Plan, the individual would no longer be considered a threat and would be appropriate for the issuance of a pass. That's the end of, uh, uh, of this uh, new form. That paragraph provides the, the cover uh, for uh, so-called special testing program, which is currently in place at the White House. The Executive Office of the President's Drug-Free Workplace Plan contains no reference to, uh, quote, a special testing program. And I'm not certain that any such program is appropriate for an institution with the national security responsibilities exercised by the President and his White House staff. We'll learn more about uh, whether my position is uh, uh, correct and justified as we hear the testimony today. Nonetheless, in an April 4, 1995 letter to Senator Richard Shelby, Patsy Thomason wrote, and I quote again, currently there are 15 EOP employees who are the subject of an individualized random drug testing program. That figure may fluctuate in either direction as employees come and go. For example, five individuals who had participated in such a program are no longer here, end quote. The White House obviously monitors this testing program closely. The Committee on Government Reform and Oversight received more than 10 periodic reports on the program in response to its request for documents related to the uh, Travel Office and the FBI file oversight. The most recent of those reports, a June 26, 1996 memo from Irene H. McGowan of the Office of Administration to Mary C. Beck, acknowledges that there were at the uh, time nine individuals in the special drug, drug testing program, six of whom had completed their testing uh, for the year. I'm deeply concerned about the standards that the White House uses in selected personnel for uh, sensitive positions. And I believe that the American people need reassurance that the Clinton administration has not critically compromised the procedures by which uh, people can gain ex access to national security information. It's important to, to note that the President and the White House, uh, the President as Commander-in-Chief of our military, holds a, uh, a trust unparalleled to any other office or responsibility in the legislative, judicial, or executive branches of our government. This office, unlike any other office in government or any other position 
at any level in the private sector may determine in an instant whether this nation is at war, whether we send our troops to foreign soil, or be required to act swiftly to protect our citizens against some international terrorism threat to our national security. Those charged with this national security responsibility and those individuals charged with backing up this office of the highest responsibility cannot any time compromise that trust even for one moment. 258 million Americans and other nations throughout the world depend on our Commander-in-Chief and those who support him to be able to make instantaneous decisions that may determine all of our fates. Regardless of who is in office, we in Congress have a responsibility to ensure that proper safeguards are instituted to pr preserve uh, that security. Congress uh, needs assurance that this special, so-called special drug testing program is adequate to safeguard the national security responsibilities that the American people have entrusted to the White House. This subcommittee has received letters asserting that the White House has a zero tolerance policy and that three people who have had positive pre-employment drug tests were not given uh, White House employment. The White House did, however, grandfather in a number of staff who came on board right after the inaugural. Uh, we should also uh, know that this so-called special testing program or any other corrective measures implemented by the White House are in fact adequate to resolve the concerns raised by the Secret Service and to convince this Congress that the incumbents in national security positions are in fact suitable for the responsibility that they hold. I am sometimes offended by the diversionary tacti tactics uh, initiated both by the White House and others in an effort to belittle uh, this issue. Uh, I view it as a very uh, serious issue and a very serious responsibility, and I'm charged uh, with some of the oversight in our civil service and personnel uh, systems uh, uh, and for our federal employees. The White House is different from other workplaces. Other workplaces, including Congress, do not have access to the instruments that could involve the nation in international conflicts. No one in Congress has access to the nuclear football. Only the President bears the responsibility for those decisions. And it's, in fact, essential that the people who are involved in advising him meet the very highest standards of suitability and security. I said on the House floor yesterday that I'm holding this hearing reluctantly. The Congress and the American people should not have cause to question the drug usage of key advisors to the President. At the same time, when the Congress has repeatedly attempted to drag this information from uh, this administration, we have repeatedly encountered evasions and sometimes uh, resistance. I trust that the witnesses before us this morning will be able to help resolve our concerns, to set the issues to rest once and for all, and to find some uh, solutions so that we may, in fact, uh, act and protect the, uh, the best interest of the American people. Uh, those are my opening comments, and I'm pleased to, to yield uh, to Mr. Kanjorski uh, for his uh, remarks. Welcome. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> Mr. Chairman. I believe that it is not coincidental that today's Civil Service Subcommittee hearing examining the efforts of the White House to maintain a drug-free workplace falls within a week uh, of the presidential candidate launching his major attack on the administration's record fighting illegal drugs. It also is not coincidental that yesterday the National Security Subcommittee held a hearing on the growing threat of heroin abuse. Both hearings seem to be timed and structured in a way calculated to achieve partisan political benefits. I believe that's unfortunate because I agree with you, Mr. Chairman, that the issue of drug use at any levels of government or in our society have a devastating effect. And illegal drug abuse is a devastating problem affecting all Americans. Its curtailment in the federal workforce and our nation's efforts to curb its production and distribution deserve this committee's serious consideration. Bipartisan solutions, successful strategies will not result from politically motivated forms where accusation 
is more important than facts, and confrontation is prefer preferred over cooperation. Mr. Chairman, your own briefing memo on this hearing suggests that the President is to blame for increasing drug abuse because you claim he has failed to use the powers of his office to lead the war on drugs. This is far from the truth. President Clinton took action to increase the funding and staff of the Office of National Drug Control Policy. President Clinton took action to elevate the position of the Director of, office of the Office to Cabinet-level status. President Clinton took action to make the outstanding appointment of General Barry McCaffrey as Director of the Office. Within the White House, the President has maintained a zero-tolerance policy with respect to illegal drug use. Each year, the White House conducts a rigorous drug testing program in accordance with the requirements of the Executive Office of the President's Drug-Free Workplace Plan. This plan provides that 12 percent, 12 percent of all White House employees will be subjected to random drug tests on an annual basis. Anyone testing positive is removed from their job. Since January of 1993, positive test results have only been returned for two individuals. Both were terminated. Both were career employees hired during the Bush administration. In contrast to what pre prevails in the White House, there is no comprehensive or stringent drug testing policy covering members of Congress and employees serving the, in the legislative branch. And incidentally, Mr. Chairman, no, we don't walk around with nuclear weapons, but sometimes we drop bombs. Those who work on Capitol Hill handle sensitive materials just like employees in the White House. Concerns over the personnel security of public officials are present here just as they are in the White House. Fairness would dictate, dictate that those members who would criticize the drug testing programs in place at the White House would themselves dis demonstrate within their own offices the standards they would measure the White House against. And I have to concede that I don't know of any member's office that has a comparable uh, free drug policy at, at the level of the White House that I'm aware of. And uh, I'm, perhaps uh, we're asking the question is those who th throw stones should not live in glass houses. And I think that perhaps is not the approach I would like to take today. The approach I'd like to take today that let's really find out what the White House policy is. Let's find out if there's anything we can add to it or stimulate to uh, increase its level of awareness. But also, let's not approach this uh, hearing today with confrontation and blame. And, and most of all, not with political uh, sideshow, because we are seven weeks away from a presidential election. Some people in this city who are of a nature to think of conspiracies or pre-thought-out ideas of why to proceed on these may conclude that there's, there's an unusual coincidence between this hearing and yesterday's hearing and the fact that Senator Dole is starting a campaign on drugs. But I know the chairman in this committee would not stoop to the level of using the Congress of the United States for political purposes. So I'm going to be very presumptive uh, of the fact that we are here today to seriously li listen to these witnesses. I look forward to the testimony of today's witnesses because I have no doubt that it will show the White House is addressing a difficult problem of drug abuse in an appropriate, responsible manner. The record will show the White House personnel serving during the Clinton administration have remained drug-free, and there is no reason to believe this will change. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the uh, gentleman, and now pleased to uh, recognize uh, Mr. Burton for his opening comments. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, there are some of us in the Congress that have advocated uh, random drug testing in our own offices for a long time. I happen to be one of them. Uh, we did uh, uh, some time ago test the people in my office. Uh, I had to pay for that myself. I paid for the testing because it's not authorized in our budget. And I'd just like to say to my colleague, Mr. Konjorski, that uh, we ought to uh, seriously consider uh, random drug testing and allow uh, our office expense account to pay for those drug testing programs, which isn't all that costly. But, uh, but right now, if we have drug testing in our offices, the member has to pay for it. Uh, and uh, that's what I, I, I was doing. Incidentally, we have a drug testing uh, opportunity for members next Wednesday, and I hope all of our colleagues will take advantage of that. Joe Barton of Texas is setting that up. 
Let me just say that uh, it is serious that this administration had a lax policy or look the other way policy when they came into office. And this has been verified by FBI agents, Secret Service agents, and others. Uh, 30 of the background in investigations, as was stated by the chairman, uh, talked about uh, previous drug use. Uh, Jeff Undercoffer testified before this committee in July, as was stated by the chairman, under oath, that he saw cocaine usage. He had uh, seen hallucin hallucinogenic uses of, of crack. Uh, and he admitted that these were ge uh, generally fairly recent use. Uh, 30 White House employees. Now, they do have a drug testing program for those who were found to be using them. And I know that has been reduced because uh, a lot of the people have been ferreted out. But one of the things that's troubling to me was this memo that was sent by Patsy Thomason on April 4th, 1995 to Senator Richard Shelby. And in that, of course, she said there were 15 EOP employees uh, that were subject to the individual, individualized random drug testing program. And what bothered me was she said that figure may fluctuate, may fluctuate in either direction as employees come and go. Now, when you read that sentence, it leads one to believe that they may hire some people who may have had a drug problem into sensitive uh, positions at the White House and that they might be included in this drug testing program. My question is, if they had a drug problem, why in the world, after the FBI background check, should they even be hired in the first place? We shouldn't be putting anybody in a sensitive position in the highest office uh, of the land who may have had a drug problem. Because, uh, you know, they may at some point use them again. They may continue to use them. Uh, using. You know, there's ways, uh, I understand, for people to cleanse themselves, at least somewhat, before they're tested. And so if somebody after an FBI background check uh, is proven to have been using drugs, uh, some of them hard drugs, uh, they certainly should not be employed in the highest office of the land. Now, regarding, regarding this being a politically motivated hearing, uh, the chairman scheduled this hearing over a month ago. Over a month ago. It wasn't just scheduled this past week. Uh, we are concerned about people in the executive branch who may be very close to the president, who may have used drugs or may be using them now. We hope they are not using them now, and the testing certainly should eliminate a lot of that problem. But there shouldn't be people in high positions in the executive branch close to the president where there's a national security uh, risk. He does have control over the nuclear capability of this country. And uh, I don't believe that, uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, anyone who uses uh, hallucinogenic drugs or, or hard drugs should be anywhere close to the chief executive uh, in case we do have a national emergency. And the one thing I would like to say uh, that, that was disconcerting to me was something I read uh, the other day. Uh, President Clinton only weeks uh, before he waged his uh, attack against George Bush's record on the drug war, uh, said in a national television interview to a national television audience of young people, uh, sure, I would inhale mar uh, mar marijuana if I could. I tried before. Now, that may have been a slip of the tongue. It may have been just a, a flippant uh, comment at the moment, of the moment, but the problem is it sent the wrong message to the young people of this country. And uh, the attitude of the White House initially toward drug use in the White House was kind of flippant. I mean, FBI background checks uh, weren't, weren't handled, uh, weren't uh, taken. And uh, they found 30 people that had used hallucinogenic drugs uh, and, and other hard drugs. And that attitude was not conducive to sending the right message to the young people of this country. And I think that's one of the reasons, Mr. Chairman, that we've seen a phenomenal rise in the use of a num a numerous kinds of drugs over the past year to two years. 
the drug increase has been just unbelievable. I think it's been doubling in, 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 in some areas. So uh, I hope that this hearing uh, is uh, revealing about the new attitude of the White House toward dealing with the drug problem. Uh, I hope this hearing leads to sending a very strong message to the young people of this country not to try hallucinogenic drugs, not to try crack cocaine or, or hard uh, drugs of any type, these mushrooms or whatever they are. Uh, and I hope that uh, it, it, it leads to a new policy in the executive branch and the entire government that will help minimize young people's use of drugs instead of seeing the trend go in the wrong direction. And with that, Mr. Chairman, uh, I yield back to balance of my time. I thank uh, the gentleman for his uh, opening statement. And uh, we have some changes in our, uh, or one change in our first panel. Uh, the uh, schedule witness was uh, Brian Sheridan, and the Department of Defense has sent uh, Peter Nelson, Deputy Director for Personnel Security for the Assistant Secretary of Dis Defense for Command Control Communications and Intelligence. Uh, our uh, second witness is, uh, and that's the same on the schedule, is uh, Jane uh, Vasaris, and uh, she is Deputy Assistant Director for Administration of the United States Secret Service. The third witness is also the same, Thomas J. Coyle, and he's Assistant Director of the Personnel Di Division of the uh, Federal Bureau of Investigation. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, and our witnesses, this is an investigations and oversight subcommittee of, uh, of Congress. And it's our custom and practice to swear in the witnesses. So if you would please stand, raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear that the, the testimony you're about to give before the subcommittee of Congress is the whole truth and nothing but the truth? I do. I do. Thank you. The record will reflect that the witness is answered in the affirmative, and I would like to thank you for your participation today. Welcome you to the subcommittee. And uh, the other uh, bit of information, since I think you're all new witnesses to our panel, what we try to do is have our witnesses um, uh, give a summary of their testimony or, or their uh, comments uh, and uh, limit that to five minutes if we can. We will be glad to uh, add more lengthy testimony or details uh, or submissions uh, for the record, and you'll be given uh, plenty of opportunity even beyond this hearing uh, for that. So uh, I will welcome you, and you will be recognized. I'll first uh, recognize again uh, Peter Nelson, Deputy Director for Personnel Security for the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Command, Control, Communications, and Intelligence. Mr. Nelson, you're recognized. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members of the subcommittee, uh, it is a pleasure to appear before you today to address your questions with regard to the use of drugs as it may relate to access to classified information for DOD military, civilian, and contractor personnel. As the Deputy Director for Personnel Security in the Office of the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Command Control, Communications, and Intelligence. Can you, uh, Mr. Nelson, could you pull that up a little bit closer? Sure. I am responsible for the development, implementation, and oversight of DOD policies and procedures governing access to classified information. A determination of loyalty, reliability, and trustworthiness for access to classified information is necessarily an attempt to predict future behavior based on past conduct. The adjudicative process is an examination of a sufficient period of a person's life to make an affirmative determination that the person is an acceptable security risk. Since 1975, excuse me, 1979, the Department of Defense has had uniform adjudication guidelines for the issuance, denial, or revocation of security clearances. These guidelines, which include, of course, one uh, on drug involvement, were updated in 1987 and again in 1996. Executive Order 12968, entitled Access to Classified Information, was signed by the President in August of 1995 and directed the Security Policy Board to develop common adjudication guidelines for determining eligibility for access to classified information. The Security Policy Board was created by Presidential Decision Directive 29, 
in September of 1994 in order to establish a new interagency policy development process which would result in more cost-effective security without diminishing the effectiveness of U.S. security. The guidelines developed by the Security Policy Board will provide the foundation for uniform security clearance and access determinations throughout the executive branch, thereby creating the climate for a reciprocal acceptance of such clearances and access. In all of our security clearance or access determinations, the adjudicative process involves the careful weighing of a number of variables known as the whole person concept. All available information about the person, both past and present, favorable and unfavorable, is considered in reaching a final determination. In the final analysis, each case must be judged on its own merits, and any doubt concerning personnel being considered for access to classified information must be resolved in favor of the national security. Of course, the Department of Defense continues to be concerned about any issue like drug involvement, which could affect a person's judgment, reliability, or trustworthiness in protecting classified national security information. That concludes my statement, and I would be happy to respond to any questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Nelson, and we will uh, defer questions until we've finished all of the uh, witnesses. I'd like to uh, call next uh, Jane uh, Varsisis, uh, Deputy Assistant Director for Administration of the United States uh, Secret Service. Uh, welcome, and you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, minutes. Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, uh, I'm pleased to be here today to talk about the Secret Service's workplace drug-free program. As you indicated in your letter inviting me to appear before the committee today, the Secret Service strives to maintain high professional standards for its workforce. It is imperative that individuals who use illegal drugs be screened out during the initial employment process before they are hired. In the interest of time, I would like to very briefly acquaint the committee with the processes and pro procedures that the service uses both for screening and selecting applicants for employment and for ensuring that employees, once hired, adhere to the standards necessary to meet the needs of the service's unique, sensitive, and very important mission. In 1988, in accordance with Executive Order 12564, and in line with statutory federal guidelines established by the Departments of Health and Human Services, the Office of Personal Management, and in conformity with guidance from the Department of Treasury, the Secret Service initiated its current drug deterrence program. Under this program, after an applicant has completed the interview and a conditional job offer has been made, a drug test is scheduled and completed prior to the initiation of a background investigation. The service's policy regarding this required screening for illegal drug use is explicitly stated in all vacancy announcements, and each individual tentatively selected for the position is notified that appointment is contingent upon the receipt of a negative drug test result. Individuals who do not pass this test are not hired. In addition to the drug test, all applicants are required to undergo a full field background investigation. This investigation may develop information of prior drug use. When this occurs, the decision regarding employment is handled on a case-by-case -case basis and the adjudication of background investigations where previous use of illegal drugs is admitted by the applicant it is carried out in accordance with Executive Orders 10450 and 129680, which cover top secret clearances and access to classified information. Since all service employees occupy critical, sensitive positions within the definition of Executive Order 10450, we must ensure that once hired, they continue to be drug free. Therefore, random drug testing of all employees is done regularly. In addition to this random testing, the service also has a reasonable suspicion testing program, whereby when there is a suspicion of drug usage, employees are notified to submit to drug testing. 
also employees involved in on-the-job accidents or who engage in unsafe on-job duty-related activities that pose a danger to others or to overall operations may be subject to testing if circumstances so warrant. The services drug testing program is a mandatory program. Therefore, any employee who refuses to be tested is subject to the full range of disciplinary actions, including, when appropriate, dismissal. If an employee tests positive for, dr for illegal drugs, the service is required to take disciplinary action, the severity of which will depend again on the circumstances of the individual case. The service has a number of options regarding the specific disciplinary action it can take to include dismissal. In, in a case of an employee who voluntarily admits his or her drug use prior to receiving a notice for testing and completes counseling or participates in employee assistance program and thereafter refrains from drug use, the decision as to whether to discipline the employee is again made on a case-by-case -case basis. Although a bar against discipline cannot be guaranteed, consideration is given to the fact that the employee came forward voluntarily. Mr. Chairman, this concludes my brief overview of the Secret Service's drug-free workplace program and the processes and procedures used to carry it out. I'm pleased to be part of this panel and to answer any questions that you or the other members have. I thank you, and uh, we will uh, come back to you. I'd like to uh, next and last recognize Thomas J. Coyle, and he's the Assistant Director of the Personnel Division of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Welcome and you're recognized, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee. Uh, my name is Thomas J. Coyle, and I am the Assistant Director of the FBI's Personnel Division. I'm assigned here at FBI Headquarters. I have served in this position since August of 1994. I'd like to thank the subcommittee for inviting the FBI to participate in this hearing this morning on drug policies affecting federal employees. In addition to conducting background investigations on its own employees, the FBI conducts background investigations at the request of the White House, as well as other agencies, as well as several committees of Congress. Requests for background investigations received from the White House involve individuals being considered for presidential appointments requiring confirmation by the United States Senate presidential appointments not requiring Senate confirmation, White House and National Security Council staff positions, and persons requiring access to the White House complex grounds. The FBI's background investigation is a comprehensive inquiry designed to gather information to assist the White House and others in the decision-making process concerning the candidate's suitability for federal employment and or access to classified information. Such, several areas, such as character, loyalty, reputation, and abilities, are addressed during the background investigation. In addition, the FBI investigation would address any illegal drug use or activity or prescription drug abuse by the candidate during the candidate's entire adult life, that is, since the individual's 18th birthday. If the investigation develops information of alleged misconduct or other types of unfavorable information about the candidate, all aspects of the allegation are thoroughly explored. Once the investigation is completed, the results are forwarded to the White House component which requested the investigation. It is the component's responsibility to disseminate the results to those involved in the appointment process itself. The FBI does not adjudicate, nor does it render opinions on the results of the investigation, which is provided to the White House component. In sum, the FBI's function in the, in the background investigation process is purely fact-finding. As I mentioned previously, the FBI also conducts background investigations on all applicants for employment with the Bureau itself. With regard to prior experimental drug use, the FBI has established guidelines for determining suitability for employment. I have described these guidelines in my written statement in detail, which I have provided to the committee. All applicants for FBI employment are required to complete an application and to make a personal declaration as to the full extent of their drug use. At that time, applicants are advised that all information provided by them concerning their drug history will be subject to verification 
by a pre-employment polygraph examination and that all prospective FBI employees will be required to submit to a urinalysis for drug abuse prior to employment. Failure to pass the polygraph or the urinalysis test would preclude the FBI having to conduct the background investigation on the candidate. If the investigation develop, develops allegations of illegal drug use by the applicant, all aspects of the allegations are thoroughly and completely investigated. A hiring decision is made based on the circumstances surrounding the alleged drug use as it relates to the FBI drug guidelines and the overall honesty of the applicant as determined by the background. The committee has also expressed an interest in the FBI's employee assistance program and the drug demand deduction program which addresses drug use by onboard employees. I have provided the committee with a copy of the FBI's drug demand reduction program manual which goes into great detail regarding these matters. The FBI's drug deterrence program is based on objectives, policies, procedures and implementation guidelines to achieve a drug-free federal workplace consistent with Executive Order 12564 and Department of Justice policy. The FBI Drug Deterrence Program establishes a comprehensive drug testing program which, as applied to FBI employees, consists of the testing of all applicants seeking employment, testing of probationary special agents during the initial first year of employment, testing of employees when there is a reasonable suspicion of illegal drug use, the testing of all employees under a random testing program, follow-up testing, and the testing of employees on a voluntary basis. The FBI testing protocol involves detection of amphetamines, cocaine, cannabis, opiates, and fencyclidine. Pursuant to the executive order, the FBI is required to discipline any employee found to use illegal drugs except if the employee self-initiates into the employee assistance program, completes counseling and rehabilitation through the FBI's employee assistance program, and thereafter refrains from drug use. As part of our employee assistance rehabilitation program, an employee may remain on duty if the employee's continued employment will not endanger public health and safety or national security. The FBI will initiate action to dismiss any employee for refusing to obtain counseling or re rehabilitation through the employee assistance program. Further, we will initiate action to dismiss an employee if the employee was, phoned, was found not to have refrained from illegal drug use after a first finding of illegal drug use, assuming the employee was not removed from the roles initially. I hope that my comments this morning have provided the committee with some insight as to how the FBI handles drug issues as they relate to the candidates for appointment to a White House position, our bureau ac applicants themselves, and the procedures utilized by the FBI in addressing drug issues which surface with regard to onboard employees. I would be more than glad to answer your questions at this time. Thank, Thank you, you uh, for your testimony. Um, I would uh, like to begin the first round of questions by as asking a couple of uh, questions here to Mr. Nelson, and we just got uh, a copy of your testimony, so I didn't have a chance to review it in depth, but uh, you testified about Executive Order uh, 12968, which is access to classified information uh, signed in, uh, a directive signed in 95 uh, to develop a common adjudica adjudication lines for determining eligibility for access to classified information. Um, are you working on that project? Uh, have you been involved in that project? Yes, sir, deeply involved. And so uh, you're trying to find a consensus, I guess, uh, drug history of drug use and abuse and problems in that area would be one of the elements you would uh, consider setting some guidelines for. Yes, Is indeed. Correct. And um, I've been told uh, I, informally that that will be issued uh, very shortly, is that correct? Well, sir, it's um, the Security Policy Board has uh, approved the, um, all of the guidelines, of which there are 13, one of which involves drug involvement, and that is currently uh, being finally reviewed over at the uh, National Security Council. And when do you anticipate that those new guidelines will be approved? And I, I, I couldn't say exactly, Ho hopefully soon, but I, I The I next two say. weeks? I, I'm, not, I'm not sure. Um, 
Well, let me ask you also about, in your testimony, you stated in personnel security investigations, drug issues rarely appear in isolation. They are frequent, frequently associated with other significant issues such as criminal conduct, alcohol abuse, or financial difficulties. Um, so uh, this is part of the cri uh, concern that you have, and there, there will be criteria which address and, uh, uh, these, these, these problems with uh, past drug or recent past uh, drug offenders. Is that correct in this? That's correct, Mr. Chairman. One of the things that concerns me is um, uh, how you develop a standard uh, for dealing with, say, um, uh, marijuana use, what's an acceptable past history use uh, for employment. Uh, and then also the, the hard, harder uh, drugs, uh, cocaine, uh, hallucinogenic drugs, uh, other drugs. Uh, is this guideline going to have some, like, uh, I believe I read somewhere where it was 10 years if you had uh, marijuana use history, uh, uh, you could uh, not be employed and, uh, uh, you know, uh, 15 years for cocaine or something like that. Do you have a standard of that sort being set? Well, sir, the, the guidelines which were um, developed and uh, coordinated uh, with all of federal agencies uh, in the executive branch um, are necessarily uh, they're not that specific. Now, one of the, the, the first factor of, of uh, several uh, that involves uh, potentially disqualifying behavior is um, illegal drug abuse. Uh, certainly, uh, drug abuse that is current and recent is, is of paramount concern. However, we found from thousands of cases that we do each year, each, each individual case is different. It is, it is extremely difficult to set a, a, an absolute threshold uh, of, of how long ago, uh, how frequent, because there are other factors that are contained in the case, such as there may be additional adverse information, or there may be a substantive um, record of uh, a stable, productive, uh, life's, uh, lifestyle since the uh, time uh, that the use took place. So we, we do not have uh, precise guidelines, as you suggest. They are more general in nature. Is that going to be left to each individual agency to determine? Or? Yes, to, to a certain degree, yes, sir. We're, we're trying to get uh, uniform application of the standards, but certainly there is flexibility uh, to the various uh, executive branch agencies. Uh, well, there are different levels, I guess, of uh, handling classified materials. Yep. Is there any uh, uh, is there going to be any standard for a higher standard as you get up these uh, levels of uh, access to classified information? Well, sir, not, this is a, a single standard um, that covers all levels of access to classified information. The, the differentiation is the amount of investigation that we do to gather background information. So that is graduated based on the level of access. But the standard of trust and reliability uh, and is, is, is the same that's embodied in these guidelines. Now, this is being done by executive order and basically, I guess, by a, a rule. It's, it's not a law. Do you think Congress should pass a, a law that sets some standards? Well, sir, I, I really don't know what the correct solution is. Um, these, these guidelines uh, change from time to time, but um, uh, we, we find the current, the current climate, the current uh, policy climate uh, seems to work uh, well from the Department of Defense's standpoint. Um, I want to turn a second, if I may, to uh, Ms. Viserys. Uh, um, I have a copy of a, uh, uh, again, the form that I read, the uh, above individual is considered a potential threat to the President of the United States, the Vice President of the United States, and or the White House complex. Uh, this uh, statement, this one happens to be for Mr. Livingstone. I pulled it uh, from one of the files, and it has approved uh, or denied. Do uh, um, you have a copy of that uh, form yes. there? Uh, is this still the form that's in place? This form uh, comes out of a um, the White House division, which is not a unit under the Office of Administration, so I, I would not, I would, ha I would only be assuming. I don't know. Well, uh, 
if this is the form that was in place when Mr. Livingstone was um, uh, put in this position, I'm wondering if Secret Service feels that this is uh, adequate. I guess he was sort of the fox that was supposed to guard the personnel, White House personnel security office. His title, I guess, was director of, of uh, White House personnel security. And this is the form that they used. Uh, it, has there been any um, uh, changes? Have there been any changes proposed in this, or any of the procedures or the wording that you know of? Or? I'm not aware of that. The only comment that I can make is that Mr. Livingstone had a permanent pass. Uh, when the Secret Service reviews uh, the FBI summary sheets for the uh, background investigations for uh, uh, people at the White House, we're looking at that information to determine, uh, to clarify issues relating to physical security. So the best that I can tell you regarding uh, Mr. Livingstone would be that, from the Secret Service's standpoint, he did not pose a, secure, a physical security problem. And so, therefore, I'm not sure if uh, the Secret Service feels any need to change the wording in the form that you have before you. Well, uh, the other question would, would be, would uh, the Secret Service um, uh, recommend any changes again in, in uh, the law or um, any action by Congress to ensure that, um, that uh, again, we have some protections in place or some standards relating to drug use and abuse, or do you think that that should be left uh, um, flexible and at the discretion of Secret Service? Well, with respect to drug usage, we would be looking at that issue from a physical security standpoint. And we do not pass judgment with respect to suitability for employment or um, national security clearance issues. And so I would have to defer to those entities that are responsible for that, i.e., uh, the White House or the intelligence community. Uh, but from a Secret Service standpoint, I think we're comfortable with um, the applicable laws and provisions because, again, we're looking at it from a physical security standpoint. Okay. I. Uh We'll yield now to the uh, gentleman, Mr. Matt Kanjorski, and uh, we'll get back to some other questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> uh, from listening to the opening statements of all three witnesses, I gather there is a significant and broad use of drugs in the federal workplace. Is, is that your experience, Mr. Nelson? Well, sir, in the, uh, the thousands of investigations that we do in Department of Defense, uh, I can't give you a specific number, but we do see significant numbers of cases with uh, prior and even more recent drug use, and much of which is admitted by the subject, him or herself. As you know, the standard form 86 that was recently approved contains a, a question relating to drug use, and uh, we find frequently uh, people are quite honest in, in, in responding in the affirmative, and then we fully explore those issues. Uh, in the Secret Service, do you find that to be the same? I'm talking now as applicants for becoming agents of the Secret Service. Is that fairly, uh, a, not, a, not that shockingly unusual to find a disclosure of drugs? Clearly, um, applicants that apply for positions within the Secret Service, we, we do see people who indicate or information comes to our attention that they have used drugs. Uh, do you have any idea? I, I know it would be a guesstimate, but would you say one in five? I don't think I have that information available. Would that bar someone beco from becoming an agent? Any disclosure of prior drug use, would that bar that individual from ever entering into the Secret Service? We will hire, um, we have hired people who have uh, used marijuana uh, on an extremely limited experimental basis. And experimental, is that what everybody sort of chuckles, the old college try? Is that you might call it that. Uh, Mr. Coyle, it, with the FBI, if, if I were an applicant and I disclosed on my application prior experimental use, would that bore me from eventually becoming an FBI agent? Uh, very possibly. Uh, experimental use has been defined in our, in our policy, which I provided to the committee. It would depend on time, circumstances, uh, 
type of narcotic or drug used uh, circumstances. Uh, you, have, and you have people then that you would consider and have considered and do have as employees that have had some past record of yes. experiment. Yes, sir, that's correct. What I'm trying to get at is that uh, uh, there was sort of a suggestion, and I don't want to put words in Mr. Burton's mouth, but that there should be a bar or, or as the chairman said, a chronological bar, and I'm, I can understand now why it almost has to be a case-by-case -case method, the way, what the circumstances were, the amounts, the potential addiction, the potential drug and everything. But are you actively seeking and working more at exclusion or at rehabilitation uh, and, and uh, overview? Uh, the random drug testing and things. I noticed in the White House they, they have a 12 percent uh, random test a year on all employees, pr those who have had any record in the past or disclosure in the past or are just wandering around the grounds, I suspect, that periodically, once a year, or 12 percent do get tested. Do you do the same thing in the FBI? Yes, we have a drug testing policy. Is, is it yeah. the same amount or less or more? Uh, let's see. I have some general figures. Um, we did, uh, let's see. I have some figures from our applicant drug testing process. Um, for example, in our applicant process itself, we did approximately 8,200 drug tests since late 1994, which we, when we started rehiring. Well, that would have been everyone. The White House yes. does that too. Everyone gets a drug test. But I mean, on a yearly basis, do you have a, 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 a factor of some percentage that gets a uh, random sample? Yes, we do, sir, but I don't okay. have that figure. No, I don't want to put you on sorry. I appreciate that. In the Secret Services, you must have a rolling random Methanol. Yes, we do. Do you have the percentage on that on a yearly basis? Uh, on an annual basis, it averages out uh, to about 15, 16 percent. Okay, so it's very close to what the White House program is. Uh, and in the Defense Department, would that be true also? Well, sir, uh, I can't uh, give you an, a, a number because that's handled by another office in the department. But what I can tell you is that somewhere between 10 and 20 percent of our denial or revocation of clearances involves so, uh, drug use either by itself or in combination with other factors. I might add, though, that um, drug use is not the most prevalent adverse issue that we look at. Uh, uh, the more frequent issues involve uh, finances, falsification of forms, and, and alcohol abuse. Drugs is number four in the, in the frequency distribution. As an abuse substance, an alcohol is even greater in the federal service. Than that the appears, uh, at least in the cases we've seen, that do, do you find, uh, let me ask, in the FBI, do you find alcohol to be one of your, uh, uh, or, or, uh, Well, sir, I, I don't really have a, a view on that. I don't have any, any figures or statistics to work from okay. on that issue, so I, I'm not really sure, to be honest about it. Okay, how about in the Secret Service, Mr. Viserys? Uh, um, as an applicant, I think the drug issue is probably more relevant. More relevant. I think so. Is there, is there anyone who has traced uh, applicants and, and disclosure prior drug use that we could see whether there's any generational change? In other words, those of us that were in school in, say, the 50s and the 60s, are we worse in that record than the people who were in there in the 70s or the 80s? Uh, and the reason I ask that is I, I noticed some of the documentation I have here that it is amazing the number of people that make the honest disclosure of prior experimental drug use. Some members that uh, appointed the Supreme Court and sitting on the court. Uh, we almost ran out of potential vice presidential candidates this last time. Uh, it, 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 it seems to have a, a, a pervasive uh, point, particularly in those people that seem to be coming into the age of leadership roles. Do you find that, that there's any peak or valley in the use? Well, sir, for the Department of Defense, we, we don't track uh, that information, uh, the thousands of uh, investigations and clearances that we issue each year. However, as you might expect, we do find that it, the, the 
incidence of uh, drug information or drug involvement is more prevalent at the younger, the, the lower end of the scale with our, certainly our, um, some of our military recruits and also our younger uh, contractor employees. Uh, we find that uh, there's more recent evidence of drug abuse. That's uh, recent evidence. But I'm right. talking about any history at all. Is it, uh, do, do you see that we we spike somewhere in the 70s or the 60s? Uh, I, I don't have any data yeah. on that, sir. I don't have any uh, data on trends, a trends analysis, but I, I would like to point out that I would say the, the, the clearly the vast majority of people that we do hire have never used drugs. And I, I don't want to give an impression that everyone that walks in the door has used drugs. Um, we have thousands of people applying for positions and we have very few positions and so we can be very selective and we, we do get very good candidates that, that have never used any kind of drug. Are, are the three of you familiar with the uh, policy of the White House on drug use? No, sir, I'm not. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, and uh, I'll yield now to Mr. Burton. <clears throat> uh, you, you folks were notified, I think, uh, two weeks or more ago about the hearing today. How come we didn't get your testimony until this morning? DOD. DOD, excuse me, DOD. Uh, sir, I notified yesterday that we would be testifying um, due to the apparent involvement or interest in uh, security clearances and uh, sensitive positions. So uh, my statement, if you will, was really not completed until late last evening or early this morning. What, well, the assistant secretary that was asked to appear before the committee was notified a couple of weeks ago. Why didn't he come or talk to you about this before that? We, uh, we did speak with his office, I believe, on Wednesday. Well, what about him? I, I can't comment on that. I was asked to... But, but, but his office talked to you on Wednesday, and we, he was asked to be here, what, two weeks ago, Mr. Chairman? Uh, yes, two weeks ago. He was notified ago. two weeks ago, and he t didn't talk to you until Wednesday about being here, so we didn't get your testimony until this morning. Yes, sir. We, we were notified... Uh, yeah, the, um, what's the, date of that? the date of the letter is um, 13 September. I believe it was received in the department on, on or about the 17th. Mm -hmm. um, you were orally notified, though, I think two weeks ago. I, I mean, I you know, that, that piece of the... correspondence that your associate just brought up mm -hmm. there, the assistant secretary was notified two weeks ago. I, I just want to convey to him that. Uh, you know, we don't take these hearings lightly, and if an assistant secretary can't be here for some reason, I think it's improper for him to wait until just a few days before the hearing and then pick somebody else who has to prepare themselves in a very short period of time to before, appear before the committee, because we like to have that testimony at least a couple of days ahead of time yes, so we can take a look at it. So you convey that to the assistant secretary, yes, will you? Uh, you said in your statement, in personnel security investigations, drug issues rarely appear in isolation. They are frequently associated with other significant issues such as criminal conduct, alcohol abuse, and financial difficulties. So it would lead one to believe from your experience that uh, people who use drugs, uh, there's other things, uh, ancillary problems that occur because of that drug usage. Yes, sir. At least in, in some, many of the cases that we see, that appears to be the case. According to the, I think, the National Prosecutors Association, 70% of all crime in the United States of America is drug-related. Seven out of ten crimes are drug-related. It's a very, very big problem as far as the criminal, uh, the expansion of crime in this country. And uh, so it's not just the use of drugs that's a big problem, and people being, you know, uh, not able to handle their affairs, but it, it, it relates to having to prostitution for people to steal things to pay for their habits and so forth. So it's a big problem. And the reason I say that people in places like the executive branch of the United States who have a current history or, or relatively current history of using drugs, they could be a real threat to national security or create other problems in, 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 in the White House and the executive branch. 
And that's why this is not just uh, 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 an issue that can be passed off by saying, well, you know, an awful lot of people do it. And a lot of people in DOD and this, uh, the uh, Secret Service and in the FBI have done it in the past. And, and we have programs to try to make sure that uh, if they're a good person today, we can hire them. That when you're talking about the White House and people who have used it in the not too distant past, you're talking about a real possible problem. And that's why it was very disconcerting to me to know that FBI background checks were put off for a long, long period of time. And then, of course, we found out that a lot of the people over there uh, were using, were using uh, uh, drugs or had used drugs in the not too distant past or were currently using them. Let me uh, just uh, say that I think your testimony has been very illuminating. I won't ask a lot of questions. I would like to say to the chairman and to my Democrat colleagues that uh, we ought to set an example in the Congress by being drug tested. We ought to try to push for random drug testing in our offices. And I would say that I think the President of the United States, Bill Clinton, and Senator Robert Dole, candidate for the presidency on the Republican ticket, should also set an example by being drug tested immediately and let those drug tests be known to the American people. I think if Bill Clinton's drug tested and Bob Dole's drug tested, it will send a very strong message to the young people of this country that we think drugs are bad and that they are willing to show to this country that they aren't using drugs and haven't used them in the past and that young people shouldn't as well. The drug usage in this country, as I said earlier, has more than doubled in many cases as far as cocaine is concerned, as far as, far as marijuana is concerned and other hallucinogenic drugs in just the last two to three years. So the examples that we've set by our legislative agenda, by our, our executive orders and so forth, has not set the right tone for this country. So I'd like to just say one more time, Mr. Chairman, before I leave, and I do have to leave, and I apologize for that, that I think the President and Senator Dole should set an example by having a drug test, doing it in front of the media and let, them, let, let the people know how serious they are about the drug problem. And uh, Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you very much for holding this hearing, and uh, I'll be happy to participate right along with them. I yield back the balance of my time. I thank the uh, gentleman, and uh, we've been joined by the ranking member of the uh, subcommittee, uh, Mr. Moran. Welcome, and you're recognized. Well, I thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I don't know that I, I'm sure this wasn't for me, but, I, but uh, listening to Mr. Burton's suggestion, do you really want the president and the, uh, uh, your presidential candidate to do a drug test in front of all the, the media. Would the gentleman, would the gentleman yield? Yeah, well, yeah. As would the gentleman yield real briefly? Uh, uh, you can get a much more accurate drug test for 90 days by just giving a little hair sample. Oh, I see. Okay, well, I think that And I'll be glad to give him a, a, little uh, give more, him a pair of scissors. Yeah, I'll give him and Senator Dole a pair of scissors. <laughs> all right. Well, it's, it's whatever media event we want to put on is, uh, is certainly okay. I'm sure it would be with President Clinton. but. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry to be late. I was at an anti-smoking event at uh, the high school in my district, which, frankly, I consider a little more important than this. Because 3,000 young people start smoking every day, and 1,000 of them are going to die a horrible death, hooked up to an iron lung with their families crying, and, and it can be avoided. And the way to avoid it is to recognize it as a drug. I think that we ought to criminalize all drugs. Certainly making or selling or using something that is deliberately addictive should be a criminal act. And we ought to be consistent about that. The fact is that tobacco is more addictive, causes more death than any other drug. And yet, I don't see this panel getting particularly concerned about that fact. Some of the members that are the most righteous, in fact, are the least supportive of any initiative on tobacco. And I don't mean the Jesse Helms and David Funderburks of the world, but all those folks who get tobacco money are very reluctant to say anything about tobacco, and yet they're the first ones to jump on the bandwagon uh, to, uh, to raise these unfounded allegations 
with regard to people who may have experimented with drugs before being hired. I am very disappointed that we are having this hearing today. We know that the media was going to be present, but we also knew that most of the members of Congress were not going to be present. I have to believe that this hearing is being driven more by political considerations than any effort to objectively evaluate the White House's drug policy. Because this is drug week for the Dole campaign. And after finding that his tax cut proposals have fallen flat, the Republican presidential candidate is trying to win votes by claiming the Clinton White House is too permissive on drug use. This is the next attempt to get uh, uh, out of the, uh, uh, the, the bottom on his, uh, on his poll numbers. So they're going to see, they'll raise this up the flagpole and see whether uh, it, this generates any interest, regardless of the merits. The campaign, obviously, is free to focus on whatever issues it wants. But that doesn't mean that this subcommittee or this committee or even this Congress should be deputized as a campaign surrogate. This subcommittee wasn't impaneled to reinforce President Dole's campaign or anybody else's campaign. The Congress was not created to be a sounding board for presidential campaigns. And that's what we have seen it become in the last few weeks. Bob Dole has a very talented and very large staff. He's received more than $75 million to run his campaign. He should use those resources rather than the resources of this subcommittee to promote his presidential campaign. Of course, every dark cloud has a silver lining, and that's what I suppose we ought to focus on, because by holding this hearing, we're giving the White House an opportunity to talk about their drug policy, which is actually a very strong one. The truth is that this White House has the same drug policy as the Bush White House and the Reagan White House, but it is enforcing it more strenuously. And that policy is zero tolerance. If an applicant tests positive for drugs, he is denied or she is denied employment. There are no exceptions and no deviations. Fortunately, the White House has rarely had to evoke this strict policy. Of the nearly 3,000 White House employees hired during the Clinton administration, three have failed their drug tests. Imagine, three out of 3,000, and all three of them were denied employment. It made no difference about their other qualifications. And that was a proper policy. The White House has also strict monitoring policies. Every year, 12% of the White House staff is subjected to random drug tests. If an employee tests positive for drug use, he is fired. There are no exceptions, no deviations. Unfortunately, this policy has rarely had to be, in, be invoked. Of the more than 800 random drug tests done during the Clinton administration, there have been only two employees who tested positive. Let me repeat that, actually. Of the more than 800 random drug tests during the Clinton administration, there have only been two who tested positive, and both of them were Bush appointees. And both were immediately dismissed. The White House has also adopted a policy to monitor employees who have used drugs either recently or frequently in the past. This is the special monitoring program that subjects these employees to random drug tests twice a year. If an employee in this program fails a drug test, they are fired. Again, no exceptions, no deviations, no matter who they know, how important they are, they get fired. Since President Clinton was inaugurated in 1993, there have been 21 employees placed on this special monitoring program. There are eight current employees in this monitoring program. None of the employees have ever failed a drug test. These are the facts, Mr. Chairman. The White House has a stringent policy, the most stringent policy that any White House has ever employed. It's more stringent than most other federal agencies. It's more stringent than the Congress, certainly a lot more stringent than the Congress. And if we're going to cast stones, we first ought to look at the Congress It's most, more stringent than most private employers. 
There is no drug problem at the White House. There is no tolerance for drug use. And I appreciate you giving us an opportunity to make that point. It's about time it was said. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, did the gentleman want to ask a question? Yeah. Go yes, right ahead. Do. Well, thank, thank you for giving me the opportunity. I'll give you a minute more. Uh, How did you pontificate? I'll give you a minute more. Well, all right. Uh, and the witnesses. The witnesses are uh, DOD, Secret Service, and FBI. And the question is uh, uh, what standards the White House uh, should have as far as uh, uh, employment of individuals with recent drug uh, history. That's the question. I understand that, Mr. Chairman. Uh, but and what their you know, standards are. I, I have to say, and, and uh, we have a, a good relationship here. Uh, but I think I've made clear, and, I, and there's no question in my mind, this really is not for the purpose of finding out what these federal agencies are doing. I really think it is for the purpose, and certainly Mr. Burton's line of questioning bore that out, of trying to embarrass the White House. So there is a clear political tinge to this. If we were really concerned about drug use, we would come up with facts to show, in other agencies, we would come up with facts to show that it was a legitimate concern. I don't see that it is. Uh, if, but. Uh, uh, let me ask, are, uh, are the Department of Defense's civilian employees subject to the same zero tolerance policy as our other members of the uniformed services? Well, sir, um, unfortunately, the uh, organization that I represent uh, does not, uh, is not involved in uh, those kinds of policies. I know, for example, I can tell you that uh, on the OSD staff, I am in a position, a drug testing position and am subject to random testing. And, and clearly, it, it is my understanding that if I get tested and tested positive, I would not only be subject to losing my security clearance, but perhaps my employment as well. I, I understand that. Now, uh, what happens if somebody had any kind of a history, no matter how limited, of drug use in the past? Let's say uh, if... Uh, uh, they were in Department of Defense or Secret Service or FBI. Are, are, do we have consistent policies across the board? I'll I, add, yes. I can only speak to uh, what the Secret Service does, so I can respond to it in, in the context of an applicant coming to the service. Uh, I believe we do have very stringent guidelines, uh, policies. Um, the caliber of uh, the individual that applies for position is so high that, that we can be very selective, and we are. And now, is, do you have any uh, policy, any, any written policy with regard to past, any past drug use? We do not have a, a, a written formula, if you will. It's not a black and white issue. Uh, it's really on a case-by-case -case basis. We review the entire file. Um, and so, as I said earlier, uh, a very limited uh, usage of marijuana, the individual, with everything else being um, appropriate as far as uh, the, the, how long ago the individual used the drug and all that, uh, the person may be hired. Uh, with respect to other drugs, uh, the likelihood is, is, practically speaking, the individual would not be hired. Mm -hmm. uh, is the FBI have the same policy, Mr. Clark? Uh, no, there, there are some differences, uh, and our, our drug standards are, are published, and, and we've provided a copy of those to this committee. Um, we use them as standards. We use them as screening mechanisms. Um, and we use them as guidelines in making our employment decisions and decisions in terms of access to uh, uh, classified material. So I think there is general uniformity amongst the, the law enforcement community but there are distinctions, there are differences, there are ad hoc applications, case-by-case -case analyses, as probably there should be in making those determinations. Do you do random drug testing? Yes, sir, we do. And the Secret Service does? Yes, we do. And DOD? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, can, uh, can you think of anything that you could do that you haven't done or any situation that has arisen that has indicated any deficiency in this policy of ensuring that uh, no one's uh, functioning is impaired through drug use? I think the Secret Service feels fairly comfortable with our current program. 
Um, as an indication of that, I think the random drug testing program has been very positive in that since its inception, which is 1988, uh, we've had nine uh, positive, confirmed positive results of, of employees. And the vast majority of that, uh, of those numbers, really occurred in the first few years. Uh, so I think that we feel that it is a very successful program, and I think we are satisfied with both the caliber of individual that we're hiring, as well as the, uh, the onboard uh, employee. Let me just ask one further question. Uh, do all three of you have an employee assistance program for people who may have a problem, want to, uh, want to address that problem, get over it, and still be able to contribute in a constructive way to the agency's mission? Do you have an EAP program? Yes. Yeah, all three do. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you. And just to uh, uh, set the record straight, uh, uh, I would like to uh, have the record reflect that uh, the very first uh, uh, statement I made and press release we sent from this committee uh, when I took over chairmanship of uh, this subcommittee was that I would conduct a hearing on uh, drugs in the workplace. Uh, and furthermore, that when we held the hearings and heard the Secret Service uh, testify as they did, and also from the FBI about the problems and uh, uh, the hiring of individuals with recent drug histories, I also announced then that I would uh, conduct these hearings. And I've done my be level best to work with the uh, other side of the aisle. Uh, to accommodate some of their wishes uh, for some of the needs that we have for our federal uh, employees and tried to take those uh, requirements on uh, as needed basis. And I think the record will also reflect that we have held a record number of hearings in the subcommittee uh, and uh, the minority has been consulted on all occasions in trying to uh, work with them. Uh, and uh, the purpose of this hearing, in fact, is to find out the practices of, of these agencies, the standards they set. And as I said in my opening statement, if we have uh, problems uh, also uh, at the White House, the very highest level charged with uh, national security, national defense, uh, we need to know what those standards are if we need legislation, corrective legislation to institute that. Uh, I do have a couple of uh, uh, questions and as we uh, try to wrap up this panel. First of all, um, I have and I'll give you a copy of this and I'm sorry some of the witnesses that were sent uh, uh, don't have the answers but we'll also give you an opportunity uh, to provide uh, information for the uh, record but to, uh, to our uh, uh, Secret Service and FBI witnesses, if you could provide them with a copy of this document dated June 10th. It's also an exhibit I obtained uh, from some of the information given to us uh, by the White House. I'm not sure of its source, but it says, Assignment from Bill Kennedy and Craig Livingstone. Question regarding law or regulations on drug use in the White House or Executive Office of the President. If one admits one present or two prior or three uh, or three months ago, six months ago, five years, drug use to, uh, to the United States Secret Service or the FBI during the screening BI process, what are the legal and or regulatory rights, duties, and responsibilities of the president with respect to that individual? And the knowledge the president now possesses about that individual's violation of the law. Does the president have the authority to, one, refuse employment, two, hire on conditions, uh, send the individual uh, to a health care professional to assess the individual's suitability risk as a precondition of employment, or three, hire the individual without any uh, conditions? And then the comment focus. We're dealing with individuals who serve at the pleasure of the uh, president, not career civil servants. Does that matter? How so? If, and you'd, you may or may not know the source of this uh, or uh, what the response to this was. But I would appreciate uh, if either of you know anything about this to comment now or provide us uh, uh, the subcommittee for the record. Uh, uh, 
both the source and the response, if possible. Are you aware of this, uh, Mr. Coyle? Are, are you aware of this? I've never seen this before today. So the Secret Service. Well, if you could, I, I would appreciate that because, uh, again, it asks some questions and questions that I also um, ask to you. Now, the other thing I said is we put in charge of the White House Personnel Security Office uh, uh, an individual who had uh, admitted, I guess, in testimony or depositions to this uh, committee, uh, drug use, uh, I guess, uh, in 1985, and he was in the White House in 1993. Mr. Coyle, would that be an acceptable standard for hiring, I guess it's eight years previous use uh, for employment with the FBI? The drug usage occurred in, in 1985. Eight, yes, he was employed in 93. Is eight years? I mean, you, we talked about standards yes, that were setting. That's a guideline. Yes, yes. Uh, our guideline, uh, our general guideline uh, for experimental use, depending on the type of, of drug involved, would be either three years or ten years, depending on the type of drug and the terms or the, the conditions under which that was used. At, what age, when, when the drug was used, what was the position or what was the employment of, of the person, a lot of factors other than just straight time involved. According to uh, your testimony, the quote, experimental use of drugs is defined as use of cannabis 15 times or less and the use of any other drugs is a combined total of five times or less within the following time constraints. Ten years for drugs other than cannabis and three years uh, for cannabis. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And that would be the standard that the FBI has. Uh, I might ask the uh, Secret Service, do the same drug use standards apply to agents assigned to the White House duties as to other Secret Service employees? Yes, they do. They do. And would the standard that uh, we employed the White House personnel uh, director, again, the director of White House personnel security, when I try to get the title right. Uh, we had uh, him employed in 93, admitted uh, drug use of 85. Is that acceptable? I don't think I have enough information to really make a to give you an opinion, it would, it would depend, depend on, on what kind of exactly use the kind of drug and circumstances and um, a lot of other factors and the frequency. Correct. Um, I also, uh, again, um, want to ask if either of you are familiar with the White House Special uh, dr Drug Testing Program that was referred to. Are you familiar? No. You're familiar. You're not familiar. Okay. Uh, do any of you know the level of positions by held of any of the people in the program or their duties or responsibility? Have any of you heard about that? No. And no, sir. is the standard that you're adopting this policy that will be announced, I guess, in the next, in, in the near future, I don't know if it'll be a couple of weeks, hopefully. Uh, I won't say that, but uh, uh, will that apply to the White House? Are they participating? The, um, the National Security Council is um, the, uh, the promulgating authority, and certainly it'll be uh, reviewed by and approved by folks in the White House staff. Uh, I'm not aware at this time whether, whether that will, will apply to them. I, I, it, it, emanate, it emanates from a presidential executive order. Now, are they participating in the development of the policy, the national security? folks or is someone is the White House uh, again we're setting a standard dealing with classified uh, information prior drug use history this is the policies that's going to be announced we've had some problems in the White House is the White House participating well essentially the the Security Policy Board which was established by the White House on presidential decision directive 29 is charged with the responsibility of, of developing and coordinating uh, these kinds of policies and and this has been accomplished uh, using the expertise of uh, security professionals from throughout the government and it has resulted in the the guidelines uh, that are now over there and are being reviewed by the uh, staff we don't know if in fact they'll be subject to this I, I am not uh, sure of that sir okay. 
Um, just a final question. Um, did any of you participate in meetings to coordinate today's testimony? Mr. Coyle? Yes, sir. I did. You did? did yes, you? I did. Did you? Yes, sir. If so, who called the meeting? Could you tell me, Mr. Coyle? Yes, sir. I called the meeting. Same. My, uh, the meeting I was in, uh, basically, was my boss and myself, so uh, we, we... You didn't participate in the meeting that uh, he called oh, no, to sir. coordinate no, testimony? No, no. Uh, Did anyone from the White House or OMB participate in uh, meetings or contact you on behalf of uh, uh, the proceedings of the subcommittee? No, sir. Yeah. No. Uh, I can only say I spoke briefly with the, um, the NSC person with whom we've been working over the past few months uh, on developing these guidelines and who currently has them now. Mm -hmm. But that was a very brief conversation and yesterday. Your, your testimony, as you testified earlier, was only approved at higher channels within DOD, no other agency or yes, other individuals. Yes, sir. Right. And was yours just within, within the agency? The, the meeting that I'm referring to was a meeting of staff to just review policies. Mr. Coyne, same. Within your agency? Yes, and the Department of Justice, yes. And none of you discussed the testimony with the White House, anyone in the White House staff? No. Right. Okay. Um, I would like to say, too, that um, uh, some of the witnesses who have been sent today are not able to answer some of the questions that we wanted to get into uh, as, as far as relationships uh, the, and uh, activities uh, dealing with the White House personnel, the security and national security uh, issues. Um, as is customary, we will leave the record open. Uh, we will be submitting additional questions in writing. Um, uh, to you and also to uh, others in your agencies uh, uh, for response. Uh, did you have any other questions, Mr. Kanjorski? Just, uh, I believe we can note for the record, and I think the panel will agree to the best of your information, the drug policies within the Office of the President and in your, in your individual agencies surpass that of the standard within the Congress of the United States. Is that correct? Well, to the extent that we have uh, drug testing, and, and apparently the Congress is not. I would imagine that would be a difference. I would agree as far as the Secret Service is concerned, correct? Yes, I would agree, too, although I'm not specifically familiar with what the standards so or the policies of Congress are. So that perhaps but we should get our house in order. Do you want to ask a question? Yeah. No. Uh, I'll, let's, uh, let's let's just go I'll on. recognize the... Let's just go on. All right. Next panel. Well, well I thank the uh, panelists then for their participation today. As I said, we will be submitting additional questions, and we appreciate your uh, uh, being with us. Thank you. You're excused. And I would like to uh, call our next uh, panel. And. Uh, I believe we had invited a representative uh, from the White House, Jack Quinn, counsel to the President, or Charles Easley, the Director of Personnel Security of the White House, and neither of them uh, uh, were uh, willing to uh, testify. But we have Mr. Franklin Reeder, Director of the Office of Administration of the Executive Office of the President. Welcome, Mr. Reeder. And it is uh, also the custom and practice of this committee to swear in our witnesses. If you would uh, stand, please. Raise your right hand. Do you swear that the testimony you're about to give before this subcommittee of Congress is the whole truth and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. As is uh, the custom of our subcommittee, uh, we will recognize you for five minutes. You may summarize. Since you're the only witness on this panel, if you'd uh, like to, you can take a little bit uh, uh, longer. and. Uh, uh, if you have additional statements, they'll be made a part of the record. Thank you. Welcome. You're recognized. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman and, um, and members of the uh, subcommittee. Um, I want to thank you for the opportunity to be here today to testify on behalf of the administration to discuss our drug testing program at the White House and, more generally, our drug-free workplace program. Uh, the reason I'm here, Mr. Chairman, is that my responsibility is as the director of the Office of Administration uh, the 
a freestanding agency within the Executive Office of the President, but included among my responsibilities are the Executive Office of the President's Personnel Security Program, um, our Drug-Free Workplace Program, including, of course, uh, the Drug Testing Program, which is an important component of our Drug-Free Workplace Program. Um, uh, I certainly take at face value and, and was pleased to hear your reassurances in your opening statement and also uh, the comments of uh, uh, Congressman Moran and Kanjorski um, that we are here to address uh, and, and get the facts about um, the drug-free workplace program and drug testing at the White House. And I certainly hope that in the course of my testimony I can address and dispel concerns that you and others have raised about that. Uh, the EOP Drug-Free Workplace Program, and in particular the special testing program about which you inquired, are issues on which we have regularly reported to the Congress over the last three years through testimony, questions for the record, semi-annual reports to the Department of Health and Human Services, and annual reports to the Congress. Uh, the implication that this has somehow been a clandestine effort is, is simply not borne out by the facts. Before addressing the details of these programs, I want to make three facts clear. Every employee in the White House is subject to pre-employment testing and is not employed if the test comes back positive. Second, every employee in the White House is in a testing designated positions, position, which means that he or she is therefore subject to random or surprise testing on any day without advance notice. Third, and this is a departure from what you've heard from the other agencies, and we all operate under the same general principles. The Chief of Staff has said, unlike the provisions of the order on which we operate, we will not allow a second chance if an individual in the White House tests positive. If an appointee of this administration in the White House tests positive, he or she will no longer be employed. And in point of fact, no appointee of this administration has ever tested positive. The EOP Drug-Free Workplace Program was established pursuant to a, a Reagan administration executive order that mandated a comprehensive drug-free workplace program and testing in federal executive branch agencies. In 1987, to regularize that program and out of concern about confidentiality of information, the Congress responded to the order by mandating that all drug-free workplace programs be, and testing facilities be certified by the Department of Health and Human Services, among other requirements. The EOP essentially adopted, initially in 1986, the model federal plan that had been developed by the Department of Health and Human Services, which provides for pre-employment testing, random testing, and the like. Um, each of the agencies, the EOP, determines which positions within that agency will be designated as drug testing positions. As of last Friday, um, uh, I come armed with numbers, Mr. Chairman, 98.5% of the staff in the Executive Office of the President and 100% of the staff in the White House are in testing designated positions. The only exceptions to anticipate that question, sir, uh, are uh, members of the President's Foreign Intelligence Advisory Board who are, who are uh, presidential appointees who are temporary, essentially they are part-time employees, and certain students in the Office of Management and Budget whose duties limit their uh, movements to the new Executive Office Building who, who do not have access to uh, sensitive information. Um, the testing program we conduct is based on a urinalysis, which is the method mandated by the Department of Health and Human Services and its mandatory guidelines for federal workplace drug testing programs. You asked in your, in your letter uh, to Mr. Quinn, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, whether we had considered uh, hair testing in, in lieu of urinalysis. We have not. We defer to the experts in these matters, and certainly if those guidelines change, we would uh, comport with those guidelines. But currently, the uh, HHS, or Health and Human Services approved program, is based on uh, urine testing. The specimens are collected by a private laboratory, again certified by the Department of Health and Human Services, under contract with the EOP, and the actual testing uh, is done by a United States Navy laboratory. All individuals occupying testing de designated positions are in the random testing pool. That means that all White House office employees are in the pool and, and subject to uh, random testing. Twelve percent, again, according to our plan, 
of the individuals subject to random testing must be tested each year, which means that over the course of the year we conduct a series of unannounced tests um, and by the end of the year have tested a minimum of 12 percent. In point of fact, we've concluded testing for this fiscal year um, and we have tested 14.5 percent of the employees uh, in the executive office of the president uh, who are in testing designated positions. Um, the random testing program is administered by career civil service staff within the Office of Administration. Uh, about six times a year, they draw a random sample. Under standards, under standards mandated by President Reagan's order and by the EOP drug free, place, free workplace plan, the confidentiality of test results and test information is carefully guarded. We limit the number of people who have access to this information. Um, and we observe very careful restrictions on a need-to-know basis. For that reason, data concerning who is tested and the results of those tests are treated with the utmost confidentiality. There are only a limited number of uh, individuals, career employees in the Office of Administration and Human Resources Division, who deal with parts of this information. All records are maintained in a safe in the Human Resources Management Division under the custody of career employees. With that as background, sir, let me turn to the subject of apparent interest to the committee, special testing that is conducted with regard to a handful of employees within the Executive Office of the President. Again, I would reiterate, we've reported to the Congress on these special testing procedures several times uh, since their inception, initially almost immediately after their inception in the spring of 1984. And I welcome the opportunity, sir, to provide this subcommittee with up-to-date information on the conduct of this effort. To understand how special testing came to be established, it's important as an initial matter to understand the role played by the Secret Service, which was described in part by the witness on the previous panel. The Secret Service is charged with the essential task of providing the President, the Vice President, and their families, um, uh, uh, excuse me, of uh, protecting the President, the Vice President, and their families. As part of their duties, they control access to the White House complex through the issuance of passes. In order for a White House employee to have access to the East and West Wing, he or she must have a blue pass issued by the Secret Service with a white W on it. That distinguishes individuals who can enter or leave the White House unescorted. Uh, and um, other than I would add members of Congress who I don't believe are required to carry passes, but, uh, who are granted similar privileges. Uh, the Secret Service makes the recommendation on whether to issue a pass based on information in the employee security file. This administration has never overruled a recommendation of the Secret Service on the issuance of a pass. The Secret Service itself has acknowledged this fact to the General Accounting Office which included its findings in an October 1995 report to the Congress, and if I may quote, according to the White House and Secret Service officials, the White House never directed the Secret Service to issue a pass in circumstances that it was otherwise reluctant to do so. The special testing process was established in spring of 1994 to address Secret Service concerns regarding a small handful of individuals. At that time, the Secret Service agreed that its concern about issuing passes to these individuals would be satisfied if those individuals agreed to be subject to special testing that required more frequent testing than other Executive Office of the President employees. In May of 1994, 11 individuals agreed to be subject to being tested at least two times a year. And the reason I say two times, Mr. Chairman, is that while these individuals are called as part of the surprise or random testing at least two times, they may be called at other times during the year. That is, they may have concluded their second test and on another random pull, since they are in testing designated positions, uh, they may be called. Again, every White House employee comes to work every day not knowing whether he or she will be called that day uh, with no more than a few hours notice to be tested. The special testing employees are then treated just like every other employee te selected for testing that day. They're sent notices in the morning asking them to report that day to the off-site clinic where the samples are collected. They provide their samples under the same secure conditions as the other employees and their samples are processed in precisely the same way. The only difference in treatment between employees in the EOP random testing pool and employees subject to special testing is that the employees subject to special testing are tested more frequently and in all events twice a year. Since January 20, 1993, and I believe Mr. Moran already mentioned this, 3,000 individuals have worked in the Executive Office of the President. The reason that number is rather large is that 
in many ways, much like congressional staff, we have a fair amount of turnover. So even though there are only approximately 1,700 employees in the Executive Office of the President, we have a significant number of people who come through. Out of that 3,000, only 21 have been subject to special testing. That is a total of 21. And as you were told in earlier testimony, uh, at no time have more than 15 been subject to special testing. And at this time, there are currently only eight subject to testing. And no one has been added um, in the last 15 months, the period of which I'm, I'm aware. You inquired about the total cost of testing. Um, the cost of testing these individuals is approximately $1,500, and that's the actual cost of the tests over the life of the special testing process. Again, and this point has been made before, but I don't want it to be lost in this discussion, no one in, who is subject to special testing has ever tested positive. These individuals did not test positive in their pre-employment tests and in the testing to which they've been subject since they were employed in the executive office. They have never tested positive. You've asked for assurance that no one has been, who has been subject to special testing, that is, who is or has been, is, and I, I quote the words from your letter to Mr. Quinn, Mr. Chairman, is involved in issues affecting national security, law enforcement, budgeting, drug policy, and or selection of personnel. I, I, if I may demur for a moment, and I'm not trying to dodge your question, you base your request on the premise, essentially, that these are positions of trust and the public needs assurances that they're not held by people whose experiences you believe will influence their policy views. In fact, it's our belief that all employees in the White House and EOP occupy positions of trust and would not hold those jobs if they had not been judged to be worthy of the trust that we put in them and been determined by the Secret Service to be eligible to receive a pass um, and, and therefore have the access that, that having a pass confers. That being said, I can tell you, based on, the, on, on conversations with those who have, have access to the list of names and those who are limited, that no one who is or who has ever been subject to special testing holds or has held a policy-making position involving issues involving national security, law enforcement, budgeting, drug policy, and or selection of personnel. It bears emphasizing that the White House established special testing to address Secret Service concerns and that this administration has never asked the Secret Service to issue a pass to someone as against the Secret Service's wishes. Since the establishment of special testing in 1994, we've reported on it frequently. The first time was in the spring of 1994, and I've already alluded to that. A year later, in 1995, while appearing before the Senate committee, um, my predecessor reported again on the status of the program, and I believe that uh, uh, that a, a quote from that appearance was read into the record uh, earlier by Mr. Burton. In short, the White House has regularly informed the Congress about the existence of special testing since the program was first instituted in May of 1994. And this, and this effort to keep the Congress informed, we believe, is emblematic of our commitment to maintaining a workplace that is free from drugs and drug use and as free as any, drug, any workplace in the country. In conclusion, I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity to provide these facts to you and for the opportunity to address the concerns that you or others might have about our drug-free workplace program. With that, I'll be happy to answer your questions. Thank you, uh, Mr. Reeder. And uh, I do have some questions. Let me start, if I may, first with this, uh, this ongoing uh, directive, uh, which is uh, uh, to prepare uh, guidelines for determining eligibility for access to classified information. Uh, the Security Policy Board uh, is uh, putting these together. We heard DOD uh, talk about this. Is the White House participating in those discussions? Uh, is the White House participating? Um, not to my knowledge directly. I believe the uh, defense witness testified, and it would typically be the case in matters of this sort, as it has been in previous administrations, that the National Security Council as the entity in the Executive Office of the President responsible for national security policy would participate in those guidelines. May I elaborate, sir, because I think the, yes. you're, uh, on, in, into an area that I think is terribly important and I think has a bearing on your concern about suitability and particularly the question of access to classified information. Um, in the past, it had been the practice 
of all administrations and uh, less than comparisons with Republican administrations in Democratic as well as Republican administrations that everyone in the White House was presumed to be authorized to have information. In fact, the presumption was made that if you carried a blue pass, you could have access to information at the highest level of classification. One of the requirements of the executive order to which the defense witness referred that, um, that we are implementing and taking quite seriously in the White House is that henceforth, access to classified information will only be granted to individuals even in the White House who have a clearance. So for the, for the first time, White House employees, even though they may be determined to be suitable for employment in the White House, they may be determined by the Secret Service to be appropriate to be issued a pass, will not be presumed to be suitable for access to classified information unless an independent judgment is made based on a review of the background and the duties of the position to which they're appointed that they need access and are qualified for access to classified information. That process was, uh, is in the process of being concluded. We began it in October of last year. Um, and once the guidelines that the uh, gentleman from the Defense Department referred to, those certainly will apply to White House employees on the same basis as they apply to every other employee in the executive branch. Now, did you say that once these are developed, it's going to apply to everyone? these uh, guidelines? The guidelines certainly will apply once they are issued. In the interim, they're the, based on uh, the on more general guidelines that are being employed within the Executive Office of the President by the uh, Executive Office of the President Personnel Security Office, we are making judgments on whether individuals should be given clearances. So, so right now that's not in place. You're making uh, your own judgments. Based we are like every other agency applying the general and you, adjudication and you said, standards. Yes, sir. Uh, do you have a written policy? Do we do we have a written it, policy? Yes. Is this policy you're talking about written that sets out the standards? Um, we is essentially uh, adhere to the same standards that the witnesses on the previous panel have described. But do you have a written policy? Is there something I can? Uh, can you provide this subcommittee, me, with a copy of your written policy that sets out the... We have documents uh, announcing and describing this policy. I'll be happy to provide them, sir. Yes. Can, and you can provide that to the... You talked about also new policy that you've adopted. Is that written and is that also available? That's the policy I'm referring to. The, the, the policy okay. prior to the current policy, sir, was one that had been in place um, as far back as any of us, and some of us have been in the complex a terribly long time, can remember, which was a presumption that anyone who had been issued a pass was entitled to access to classified information. The new policy to which I refer was written and issued subsequent to the uh, issuance of the President's executive order and prescribes that uh, there will be an independent determination on access to classified information. Now, the special dr uh, drug testing program that was instituted wasn't was, was instituted by the White House, but it was really a deal struck between, I guess, the Secret Service and the White House because the Secret Service was concerned about what they saw folks coming into employment in the White House. Is that correct? Um, I'm not sure I can confirm your uh, statement about pattern of folks coming in. Uh, the process well, they, of issue they, they had uh, expressed concern about the histories, and these histories included recent drug use or abuse to, to cause enough concern that some policy be developed. So the White House, in response, this White House developed this special drug testing program. It is my understanding, is and, I, and I believe the words I heard used earlier were consistent with my understanding, that this was an arrangement mutually agreed to between the Secret Service and the White House in 1994 to address concerns that the Secret Service had, and I, and I believe it was uh, the phrase I've heard used and the criteria, which are the Secret Service's criteria, not ours, were concerns either about frequency or recency of use that would be addressed if the individual agreed to participate voluntarily uh, in additional testing beyond the random testing to which everybody's subject. Uh, let me direct your attention to the guidelines provi provided in the FBI's testimony. It provides, among other criteria that, and I, this is a quote, an applicant who used any drugs while employed in a position which carries with it a high level of responsibility or public trust will be found unsuitable for employment. That's the end of the quote. It also 
establishes that an applicant who is discovered to have deliberately misrepresented a drug history, sold illegal drugs, or used marijuana within the past three years will be found to be unsuitable for employment. Can you assure the subcommittee that the uh, White House at least matches the FBI standard for its current employees? The, um, I can give you that assurance with a, with a proviso that I think is terribly important. You've, you have, uh, and I think this was a confusion in the conversation you had with the FBI witness, used interchangeably the term standard and guideline. I believe what the FBI testified to, and what I will be happy to testify to, is that our standards are at least as stringent, but those standards need to be understood in context. I think all of the witnesses on the previous panel told you that they make judgments on a case-by-case -case basis, considering the merits, that each case has to stand alone, and that what they take into account, whether we're looking at an, in, a, a history of alcohol abuse or indebtedness or drug use, uh, or, or other potential problems that go to the, an individual's suitability is the recency of those occurrences, the severity of those occurrences, the circumstances surrounding those occurrences, and actions taken by the individual to, to address those concerns. Um, and, and I think again, all of the witnesses on the previous panel said similar things, sir. Um, the truthfulness and the candor of the applicant in being forthcoming in, uh, about that problem. Um, they noted, and, and we would as well, that in those instances, when we learn of these things, we invariably learn of them from the applicant, him or herself, uh, not through some investigation. My final question, sir, is um, given the history that we have of uh, the former director of White House uh, personnel security, um, if he were an applicant today and had the same history that he has, this is his, uh, again, his uh, uh, form from the uh, yes. Secret Service, uh, could uh, or would Craig Livingstone uh, be employed again? Well, um, that was an eight-year eight history. I don't mean cute, sir, but I'll, uh, literally all I know about Mr. Livingstone's personal well, background let's is let's not is use Mr. Livingstone. Okay. If someone had admitted to, I guess, eight years is uh, uh, the uh, testimony that he gave in dep deposition within eight years, could they still uh, occupy this position of director of White House personnel security? Well. Um, I can only answer that as we are currently operating that function pursuant to the Chief of Staff's directive. And the Chief of Staff has directed that that function now be um, under the supervision of a career professional of long standing. So he would not be eligible. Um, he he or, would not fill the an position. An individual with a record of that uh, or history of that nature would not be eligible. Um, as, as the office is currently constituted um, as a career position with a uh, requiring a person of, of with credentials of long standing, um, uh, we would be looking in a different direction. Okay, I thank you, and I yield to the uh, ranking member, Mr. Moran. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I heard your response to my statement, uh, it, but. Uh, uh, again, I, I don't accuse you personally. Uh, I do think, though, that there's been some pressure from the Republican leadership and the Dole campaign to conduct this hearing. And since this hearing has far more to do with Senator Dole's campaign than uh, congressional oversight, uh, I think it's instructive to put into the record some statements from Senator Dole uh, when he was arguing for the uh, nomination of uh, the director of the Office of Thrift Supervision in 1990 uh, and uh, addressed the uh, use of marijuana and cocaine by that Republican nominee, uh, he said that uh, if we held, held, hold him up to that standard, then we're going to wipe out a generation of men and women who are about that age who, who may have experimented one time or another with some type of drug. Keep in mind that in an earlier generation it may have been some other vice, in a future generation it may be something else. 
Then in, in 1991, when Senator Dole defended Judge Clarence Thomas's use of marijuana, he said that it would not impact on his confirmation process. Uh, then when Senator Dole defended Supreme Court Justice uh, Ginsburg's uh, drug use, uh, which uh, was experimentation when he was young, but then uh, he used it as well in the late 1970s. In 1987, he said that uh, that in itself would probably not be enough to derail the nomination. Uh, and we've got several more uh, quotes from Senator Dole, and I, I think that actually uh, Senator Dole was uh, correct, and I applaud his judgment that person, and while people may have made that uh, uh, what matters is whether they have learned from them, their mistakes and are going to repeat them. Uh, now, I think it is also important to underscore for the record that of the approximately 3,000 White House employees who have been hired during the Clinton administration, only three failed their drug tests and all of them were denied employment. Uh, that we have random drug tests of 12 percent of the White House staff and of those more than 800 random drug tests dur done during the Clinton administration, there have only been two employees who tested positive and both of them were appointees of President Bush, and both were immediately And lastly, in terms of uh, what needs to be underscored on the record of this hearing, the Clinton White House has the same basic policy that the Bush White House and the Reagan White House had, and that is zero tolerance. I can see no justification for anyone suggesting anything other than zero tolerance. Uh, now, I appreciate your testimony, uh, Mr. Reader, but uh, it, it uh, is uh, comprehensive and conclusive. Uh, have you, are you aware of any situation whatsoever where the ability of a White House personnel to fully perform their duties, or in fact, any personnel uh, hired by the White House or even hired by this administration whose ability to function has in any way been compromised by drug use, even in the most distant past, or any variation from the zero tolerance policy that the Clinton administration announced and in fact has enforced? Um, no, sir, I'm not. And, and if I may amplify on, on two points, um, I, I think it is terribly important, as you've suggested, to point out that um, th we do not mean to suggest by virtue of claiming that we have a tough policy on drugs, any invidious comparisons with any previous administration. Uh, we're following the same processes. The only, the only subtle difference is that for, for very good reasons, the Reagan executive order specifically provides for a second chance in some instances, and as the witnesses on the previous panel indicated, even they permit uh, in their agencies uh, mitigating circumstances and enrollment in an employee assistance program to be used um, as an as a way of keeping some, if, of giving one a, someone a second chance in the case of the White House because of the concern about public trust and perceptions um, there is zero tolerance but the answer to your question is I am aware of none um, I've uh, I'm in a position to know that uh, that that no one's performance um, in this administration has ever been compromised uh, by the use of an illegal substance I have, thank you mr. I've only one final uh, question because some people have charged that the Clinton administration has in fact been too tough on uh, drug testing and in fact uh, a federal judge, Judge Ritchie, on July 24th ruled that mandatory testing of all employees with entry passes to the old executive office building, which as you know is right next to the White House, cannot be justified by security or safety arguments. Uh, can, uh, can you 
tell us, uh, number one, what was the reaction of the White House when they got that uh, court ruling? And secondly, what in fact did precipitate that court ruling? What precipitated the ruling, if I may flip the sequence of your questions, right. Congressman, um, was a um, was an action brought by two employees of the Executive Office of the President, um, or actually an employee in which a second employee joined, uh, who had been called for random testing, that is an individual in testing designated position, uh, seeking to um, seeking to restrain us from administering the test. Uh, and Judge Ritchie initially issued a temporary restraining order and then on the merits ruled um, that the criteria that the Executive Office of the President was using for determining who was in a testing designated position uh, were overly broad and that uh, there was not a sufficient nexus between access to the Executive Office of the President, uh, to the Executive Office complex um, and drug use to warrant uh, random testing those individuals. We strongly disagree with that. Uh, filed, uh, fought vigorously but obviously unsuccessfully at the district court level um, and uh, the Justice Department has appealed that action uh, and in fact has sought and been granted expedited review of that appeal uh, so that I, it's my understanding that briefs are scheduled to be filed in early November and we're anxious for early disposition of that. Uh, we will, um, and the Justice Department obviously on behalf of the government will argue vigorously um, that the standards that, that we and I would point out previous administrations have applied to determine who is in a sensitive position and therefore should be subject to random testing um, are appropriate uh, and warranted. So, um, uh, and as I said, we're hoping for a speedy outcome on that. Thank you, Mr. Reed. Thank you, Mr. Reed. Mr. Kondorsky. Mr. Chairman, I assume you were going back to your question. That's perfect, all right. Uh, Mr. Reader, first of all, uh, it's just as an observation. Uh, I'm impressed with your testimony. And I'll just want to delve into uh, some of the understanding I have. You are holding this position now in the Clinton administration, but you have held a, a, a professional position in prior administrations in the White um, House, is that correct? I was, until uh, June of last year, a uh, career civil servant um, serving the bulk of my career, although not all of it, uh, in the Executive Office of the President. Uh, uh, and fortunately, I've had many opportunities to work with uh, this committee in, in, in policy as well as management roles. In June of last year, I was appointed uh, by the President to my current position, in which I serve at the pleasure of the President. So that the record is clear, though, what other presidential administrations uh, did you serve? Um, I've, I've served uh, in the Executive Office of the President um, in every administration uh, since and including the Nixon administration. All right. Now, to your knowledge, has this administration maintained at least as strict, if not a stricter, drug policy of any other compared um, to any other administration? From the perspective of one who has been both the subject of that policy as occupying a, brand, a testing designated position and now with, as one who's responsible, who's responsible for administering it, uh, absolutely yes. Uh, again, uh, I don't mean to suggest in any way that uh, the, the previous administrations uh, have been in any way lax, uh, but the signals are clear and unequivocal um, to the point of the Chief of Staff's declaration, uh, Chief of Staff Panetta's declaration in 1994, not that in, in the case of White House office employees, uh, that any positive test constituted a basis for immediate dismissal um, and that given the sensitivity of the White House, um, that would be required. Uh, I want to, again, address a concern that implicit, was implicit in, in, in the Chairman's questions and, and Mr. Burton's, and I know that you and, and Mr. Moran share as well. Um, we take the trustworthiness and reliability of the people who work in the White House terribly seriously uh, and, and for two simple and obvious reasons. First we cannot operate effectively in any administration unless we have people of, of judgment and character in positions of trust in the White House. And second, the American people can't trust the White House unless it is, they are convinced that people of trust and character work in the White House. I appreciate that, and I'll tell you quite frankly, uh, the impressions when, when you hear drug use, drug abuse, 
and, and tying in names, uh, even though there's no supportive evidence for that, people start to wonder whether there's a problem. And I think by innuendo or by suggestion, there has been this attempt, whether it's politically motivated or not, over the last several months to create an appearance that there's something wrong. But as I gather from your testimony, as a, as a professional who has served in every administration since the Nixon administration, that there, one, is not a problem in the White House of, of drugs. Two, there is at least as stringent, if not a more stringent, an adherence to a strong drug-free policy in the White House, and that the American people can rest assured tonight that under the leadership of President Clinton, we do not have a problem in the White House. Is that correct? Absolutely, on all three counts. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Kanjorski. Uh, and uh, Mr. Reeder, thank you for your appearance here today. Uh, I have an opening statement that I would ask and his consent might be submitted for the record at this time. Let me just start by indicating that uh, I would reject the characterization that this hearing is, is a, a political uh, inspired. Uh, this actually, this hearing has been scheduled for some period of time, and I think it it is. Uh, I think it's it's reasonable to think that, given some of the allegations that have come forward, this was a a reasonable uh, thing to conduct oversight. That's our job in this committee is to conduct oversight. Obviously, anything that goes on uh, it was seven weeks before a national election has political overtones. But I can assure you that it is not this chairman's intention to pursue these things for purely political motives. We're really trying to do a job that we're assigned to do, which is to conduct oversight and make recommendations of how things might be improved or how uh, procedures, processes, uh, uh, these kinds of activities can be improved. So uh, your testimony is helpful, and I think uh, the, 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 uh, the hearing itself has provided some very helpful uh, information for the committee. Uh, a few questions. You testified that only uh, 21 persons have been involved in the uh, testing program. During the first year, however, many of the employees, at least we've learned from other, uh, other avenues that we've been investigating, many employees worked in the White House without benefit of background investigation. There was, in fact, a, an enormous backlog, um, which uh, resulted in the fact that we had uh, a lot of employees in the White House for long periods of time who had not completed their background investigations. How long could an employee have worked in a sensitive position, for example, one involving national security duties, without a background investigation? Um, uh, unfortunately, I didn't come prepared with the facts and figures on that, uh, Mr. Chairman. But Could you uh, provide uh, that for the record? Absolutely. Uh, and I believe there was an audit conducted at the behest of, of this committee. Um, oh, I, in fact, we, I have it, and um, while I'm sure it's in the files of the committee, I'll be happy to provide another copy of an audit done by the General Accounting Office looking at the very issue of the pass and security clearance process and the promptness with which that was done at the beginning of this administration. Um, as in every transition, um, there is a serious administrative problem in the first several months as a new administration takes office uh, and seeks to get its appointees in place and move in the direction that it believes the, the electorate uh, has mandated that it go um, in, at the same time, assuring that those individuals are <clears throat> drug tested and subjected to all of the t usual clearance processes. The comparisons that we've been able to do, uh, at least with respect to drug testing, the issue that, that uh, um, I prepped here today to, to address, uh, suggest that this administration moved with somewhat greater speed than did the previous administration, that is, the, the Bush administration, in the first 12 months to assure that everyone had been tested. I'll be happy to provide those data for the record as well. Again, I don't mean to suggest that the Bush administration didn't take maintaining a drug-free workplace seriously, um, but they did move, ser move quickly, and in fact, everyone had been tested, I believe, by midsummer. But I'll be happy to provide the numbers, both with respect to drug testing of the new Clinton administration appointees in 93 um, and with respect to the conduct of background investigations and the issuance of permanent passes. Um, I can tell you to elaborate that once that initial backlog was worked down, every White House employee is, tested bef is drug tested before he or she comes to work 
every White House employee completes the standard, uh, in addition to a preliminary questionnaire, can, completes the standard, and I trust you've seen it, somewhat uh, burdensome uh, security questionnaire used by all investigative agencies within 30 days of coming on board. And uh, by statute, we are required, and we adhere, adhere 100 percent to a proviso that um, we complete and make a recommendation with respect to a background investigation and a permanent pass um, within uh, 180 days. Um, and we've done that without exception. I advise that uh, by staff that perhaps one explanation for the um, slowness or the uh, in terms of the Bush administration was that I think the Bush administration was in fact setting up the program I and mean, they were really initiating the program where they were. Um, there was, um, I'm not sure what all the explanations are. They, the program in fact was set up uh, in 1986 uh, and there may be other explanations. Again, I don't mean to imply and, and I, uh, at the risk I, I may be um, belaboring the point, I don't mean to imply at all any invidious comparison with the previous administration, but only to suggest that that's indicative of the fact that in order for any new administration to get rolling, um, it needs to get its people on board and therefore um, they then in the ensuing months need to play catch up in, the, uh, uh, in going through the various administrative processes that would, one would normally go through uh, prior to someone's employment. Uh, in a, at a later stage in the administration. I think the program was, was initiated in 1988, not 1986, as I'm... Um, you're correct, and, and I, uh, I beg your pardon. I, I am... I stand corrected. The order was an 86 order. Right. You're correct, sir. How many of the 3,000 employees who have worked in the White House since January of 93, in other words, since the inception of this administration, uh, and this, again, you may have to provide for the record, uh, never completed a background investigation? Um, I'll have to provide that for the record. I mean, it is my understanding the last time I looked at the issue, and it has been um, some time, no one then on the White House roles or on the Executive Office of the President's roles had failed to complete his or her background investigation um, or, or was within the 180 days that is permitted by the law. Um, I can't tell you, but I'll be happy to see if I can get for the record whether anybody could have come and gone before a background investigation was completed. Yeah, if you could provide that for the record, that'd be helpful. Absolutely. Let me direct your attention to another document that was provided to the committee, and I think you have a copy of it. It's dated June 10th, 1993, and entitled Assignment from Bill Kennedy and Craig Livingstone. Is, do you have that uh, uh, document? I'm, I'm looking at it for the first time, yes, sir. It's dated June 10, 1993. The memo was written when many White House employees were being issued temporary passes. This was, uh, this was during that uh, first six-month uh, period of the administration. Uh, and those temporary passes were renewed repeatedly, as we understood it, during the period of time. Uh, it, the assignment to to me, and perhaps there's another uh, spin on this, but it sounds like staff trying to find a way around restrictions on employment of drug users. Uh, to whom was this assignment addressed? Is there, there's no indication on it. It says assignment from Bill Kennedy and Craig Livingstone, but it doesn't indicate to whom it was um, addressed. I don't know, Mr. Chairman. If you can find it, uh, if you could find out, it would uh, be helpful to know uh, who, certainly, who it was assigned to. I will certainly to. attempt to, yes, sir. And was any response to this assignment ever completed, do you know? I mean, again, um, if you don't know who it was assigned to, sure. you probably don't know whether any response was ever completed. Uh, the memo envisions the possibility of hiring officials who serve at the pleasure of the president, even though they might admit current drug use. I mean, I think that is least raised as, as, a, as a possibility by this assignment. Uh, how were questions about particular applicants resolved before, prior to the time the special testing program was implemented? Well, the, the process is the same, sir, and, uh, and, and it's a relatively uh, straightforward one. Um, individuals... Uh, I mean, the process is the same both as before and after the Before and testing. after, uh, and that is that uh, upon completion of all of the um, requisite reviews, which include um, a pre-employment test, which again must be negative. Um, the 
the interviewing of the applicant, um, we ask people before we put them through a background investigation whether that investigation will reveal information that's likely to be disqualifying. It turns out to be a service to the applicant because if he or she believes that there's information and understands that information in his or her background would be disqualifying, uh, the process can stop at that point. Um, we then do a name check and, uh, and ask people to fill out the longer security questionnaire. After the questionnaire, after the background investigation is returned by the Federal Bureau of Investigation and as the FBI witness testified with a, a summary of pertinent information, not with a recommendation, um, we review that information. We also do appropriate credit checks and other things because security goes not simply to a question of loyalty or substance abuse. Uh, security can be compromised by um, uh, excessive indebtedness or gambling addiction or other f indications of financial irresponsibility that might make a person susceptible to coercion or um, distort his or her judgment. All of that information is compiled. We then make a judgment that is the, the security professionals who examine the file in consultation with the employing office as to whether there's any information in that file that would raise questions about the person's suitability. Um, if the determination is that there are none, the matter is referred to the Secret Service for the issuance of a permanent or permanent pass. At that point, uh, the Secret Service looks at the issue from its perspective, and again, as the Secret Service witness earlier testified, deals specifically with questions of whether any, th any information revealed in the material provided to them raises concerns with regard to the Secret Service's responsibility for protecting the President and therefore the environs in which the President uh, operates. Um, Let they me just ask you, have there been instances where in fact the Secret Service has, has indicated that they had serious problems uh, with a particular applicant and uh, what were the disposition of those? Um, the, there are di as, as all of the previous witnesses have indicated, the question of uh, suitability questions are ultimately matters of judgment that are dealt with on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, there have been doubtless been instances in which there have been discussions between the Secret Service and the employing agency in our security office regarding information that was raised, in part because um, we will not send a file forward unless we believe that the person is appropriate to have a pass issued. Um, as the GAO reported in, in the very same report on pass issuance, uh, in no instance has the White House during this administration, and again, I don't know about previous administrations, so I can't, I'm, I'm not implying that they have, um, directed the Secret Service to issue a pass in an instance when they were reluctant to do so. Okay. What difference would it make in the adjudication of background investigations for White House personnel if the position that was under consideration was a career civil service rather than, quote, at the pleasure of the President? Would there be any there, difference, um, different disposition? Of there is uh, certainly not with respect to the disposition. Um, I mean, and we certainly would not apply a lower standard to uh, political appointees than to Title V employees. Um, they are all subject to the same rigorous review. There is a subtle difference at the pre-employment process, and again, I think this was, uh, my predecessors have testified to this, um, and that is when we, uh, that drug testing um, results have to come back for Title V employees before they're employed. In the case of White House employees, we don't get the drug testing results back until, uh, in some instance, after the individual is employed. And the reason for that is very simple. Um, the President does not have to have grounds for dismissing someone who serves at his pleasure. A Title V employee uh, would be subject to certain uh, other requirements if one were to um, choose to dismiss a person after he or she were employed. Mm -hmm. I just have um, a couple more questions. The, uh, we've received testimony before this committee that many White House employees served, as I've indicated earlier, for long periods of time on so-called temporary passes, which were then renewed periodically uh, and were renewed sometimes for long periods, either because they had not submitted background investigation forms, and I gather that at least initially there was um, lack of cooperation or for, for whatever reason there were the times when it was difficult to get the background uh, the forms back, or because those investigations were incomplete. 
we've also learned that some so-called special employees, contractors and consultants, have uh, over the period of time worked very closely with the president, even if your agencies had, uh, had never performed, if, if there had been no background investigation uh, conducted on them. And uh, that seems to be sort of uh, individuals who might fall through the cracks. I mean, if the people who are there as consultants or as advisors, uh, but you know, who have uh, definite access to the president, have definite contact with him. What requirements would you have for checking the backgrounds of consultants or contractors providing services to the White House? Is there any? Uh, Absolutely. And, and your, your question really takes, uh, goes in two directions, Mr. Chairman. First, um, any, employ, any individual who is issued a pass is subject to the same requirements with respect to background name, initial FBI name checks, background investigations, right. and ultimately a determination by the Secret Service that he or th she meets the criteria that the, that the Secret Service which, uh, witness testified to regarding their responsibility for protecting the president. Be a little different, though, standard, would it not, for a temporary, for, in other words, for a uh, consultant who's only going to be there uh, on, not on a regular basis? Um, well. It, there's a practical difference because anybody who is in the complex less than 180 days may not have a completed background investigation. Right. So all we can do is do the preliminary, we do the preliminary security screening and the, F, and the Secret Service uh, and we do a name right. check. So we, uh, there is a preliminary check that can be done that is the same as that done for anybody else who would be in the complex less than 180 days. Now there's another aspect... So you're saying that, that a... Uh an employee could provide services with a, without a background, without a full background investigation uh, within 180 days. Anything over that would require the full background. An employee, an individual who, but those individuals would be subject to the same preliminary clearance as would any other individual who had been in the complex less than 180 days. There's another aspect to your question, sir, that I want to make sure yeah. is, is in the record, and that is that any individual who would be determined to be a special government employee and participate uh, in that context would be subject to the requirements of law applicable to special government employees, including uh, financial disclosures and other requirements. So there is both the secure, there are both security and uh, integrity considerations that we apply. With respect to contractors, contractors wor who work on the premises um, are subject to precisely the same uh, requirements as are individuals who are employees of the Executive Office of the President uh, with respect to uh, pre-employment, that in this case pre-employment being uh, prior to coming onto the complex, not with their primary employer, um, and with respect to the completion of a background investigation before a permanent pass is issued. Um, it makes it terribly expensive, for example, when we have physical work done, uh, that is, uh, done, work done on the physical plant, because every one of those individuals, unless he or she has been subject to all those kinds of exhaustive clearances, has to be escorted by somebody who has. Mm -hmm. So uh, that often, as your colleagues on appropriations would probably tell you, drives the cost of projects because um, we apply the same standards to individuals who work for us under contract as we would to individuals who are on the payroll. Uh, aren't there, however, some problems with some consultants who don't ever get passes if they're only on an access list? I mean, wouldn't there, um, isn't there cases where know, they would have th no This problem? is, uh, at the risk of dissolving into cliches, a rock and a hard place problem. Uh, earlier in this administration, um, under an edict of the previous, uh, of, of the, of the previous chief of staff, those individuals were issued hard passes, and when they were issued hard passes, they were subject to the same security scrutiny as was ever, anyone else who had a hard pass. There was considerable criticism of the White House for allowing those individuals unescorted access to the White House because they were, in fact, consultants or in, in, informal associates of the president. Um, the problem is that the White House is the President's house, and whereas uh, you may have a friend or confidant who comes to visit you, everybody who comes to the White House has to be cleared in, and so if they want uh, frequent access to the White House, um, they have to be issued a pass. Because of those criticisms, uh, Chief of Staff Panetta reversed that policy and said those people won't be given hard permanent passes, therefore there's no basis for subjecting them to the normal scrutiny that, that the hard pass process implies. Now, they then have to be cleared in 
either on a case-by-case -case basis or placed on an access list, but in both instances, uh, that means that they do not have the same level of access to the White House as would individuals who have hard passes. So, uh, yes, you are correct. There are individuals who are um, confidants of the president or individuals with whom he wishes to consult from time to time who, um, who are cleared into the White House for appointments with him. Uh, they don't have hard passes, and because they don't have hard passes, they're not subject to the same security review as they would. Would they be they accompanied were. when they were on the premises? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, going back to your, you mentioned the special government employee, and Congress, uh, this committee, is considering uh, creating such a category uh, in the Presidential and Executive Office Accountability Act that would, in effect, strengthen oversight of uh, such consultants uh, as, a, as a strengthening procedure, and really a uh, redefining somewhat what is a special government employee because there has been some confusion about uh, what yes, that sir. involves. Is there any way short of legislation to make such persons accountable in your view? Well, um, we believe, Mr. Chairman, that the policies that are currently in effect at the White House ensure that those individuals are accountable and that individuals who would by anyone's definition qualify as special government employees are already subject to disclosure. Um, but as I testified before Mr. Horn and another subcommittee, um, uh, the administration would certainly support uh, the language as in the reported version of H.R. 3452 with respect to special government employees to clarify any ambiguity uh, that might exist with respect to those individuals. Mm -hmm. Just one final question. Um, I think Mr. Micah indicated earlier that uh, we're really looking for assurances in this hearing that any security problems that may have existed to have been resolved. And in that regard, uh, I think, are you aware that uh, the Secret Service did, in fact, initially reject some passes in late 1993 uh, prior to the individual drug testing program and that those, I believe, were ultimately approved? Were you aware that that actually um, What I am aware transpired? of uh, is that the, secret, the GAO found and, and the Secret Service uh, did not disagree uh, that in no instance had the White House insisted that the Secret Service issued a pass. Even over their objections? In which yeah. they were, I think the phraseology in the GAO report, in any case in which the Secret Service was reluctant to do so. Even reluctant, I mean, without a, without a hard and fast sort of uh, rejection. Yes, sir. The reluctance and, would and, result and in that, And that language, again, is, is in the report that I'll be happy to provide and, and, and leave. And, uh, okay. Very good. Uh, Mr. Moran. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm glad you raised that, uh, that last point because the information on White House employees came to light because executive branch employees are subjected to random drug tests. And of course, the White House acted properly, quickly, and, uh, uh, and uh, I think in a uh, pretty strict fashion with regard to those employees and every other employee. Uh, in contrast, Mr. Chairman, congressional drug testing policy is left solely to the discretion of individual members. Uh, I think anyone who has raised these questions about uh, the White House and executive branch's policy ought to tell us what their policy is. Uh, I know that uh, the, the chairman of our committees and of our subcommittees would not want to be hypocritical. Uh, I'd be curious, do you, do you drug test your own staff, Mr. Chairman? I'm Rand under very serious consideration in view of uh, Mr. I would have been advised by Mr. Barton that this is something we should all consider, and I think it, uh, it is very worthy of consideration. You don't do it now. Not at the present time. Uh, and I, I don't think Mr. Do you? Mike. No. No, but I'm not the one that has raised it. I've been content with the policy, and I haven't hypocritically been accusing the White House so you of would not suggest doing that we its job. Not, we should not be doing testing. Is that your position, that we should not pursue testing? No, my anything? position is that we ought not hold hearings for uh, 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 purposes that uh, are not uh, relevant nor uh, even uh, nor in any way necessary. What, we've, what we have determined here is that we have a very strict zero-tolerance policy that the White House 
in fact does random drug testing on 12 percent of its workforce we don't do that in the Congress. We don't do any trend of drug testing. I don't know of any members that do that. Maybe, maybe there is a member, and that member certainly uh, would uh, properly be asking questions of the White House whether they, the White House is as tough on drug use as they are. Uh, but I have yet to find such a member who could, uh, uh, who would be able to posture themselves in such a way that it would not be hypocritical. Uh, if, but the, uh, the reality is that the Congress doesn't. The Congress doesn't do anywhere near what the White House or even uh, any of the executive agencies do. Uh, and as I mentioned before, Mr. Chairman, and probably if you were aware of that, you, you might not have had these hearings that of those random tests, they've only uncovered two people. And of course, those were uh, former Bush appointees and they were fired immediately. Uh, I'm not sure that even if we were doing drug testing and we found some people that had used uh, drugs uh, sometime in the, uh, in the past or maybe even now, although I'm not aware of any uh, uh, congressional staff that use drugs now, but if, if we found them, I don't know that we would be as tough as the Clinton administration having absolute zero tolerance. Uh, but uh, but I, I do think that that's a, a relevant point to make, that uh, we hold a hearing trying to find some way uh, to accuse the uh, White House of not being uh, uh, a, 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 com uh, a completely hard line on this uh, matter of uh, any drug use whatsoever. We have found that they are hard line, that they allow no exceptions, and I, I just can't help but, but observe that, uh, that in the Congress we are not, that the people asking the questions don't even uh, drug test, per, perhaps don't even ask such questions uh, on applications whether their employees have ever used drugs in the past. Uh, I, I think that uh, people in glass houses ought not throw stones, but uh, nevertheless, uh, uh, having, uh, having said that, I do appreciate the fact that we have been able to have this hearing because everything that has come out of this hearing shows that uh, the Clinton administration has taken a, a great deal of initiative, has built upon the zero tolerance policy of the Bush administration and the Reagan administration, has implemented it in, uh, to a much tougher standard than any, uh, res any administration has ever applied to any of its employees. And I think the results show that they simply aren't finding people uh, who are uh, using, experimenting uh, with drugs, or in fact, uh, uh, very few people uh, who use drugs. Uh, that should give the American people greater confidence that the people who are serving them, that they are relying upon, uh, are people that uh, that do, in fact, perform to a very high standard that, in fact, is appropriate for our federal government. Uh, so uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, I, I, uh, although I didn't think that I would have such reason to appreciate this hearing, I, I, I think both the Clinton White House and the Democratic members appreciate the hearing for the truth that has come out of it. Thank you. I think we all appreciate the hearing, perhaps for somewhat different reasons, but uh, we all do appreciate the hearing. Uh, Mr. Kanjorski. Mr. Chairman, I do want to make a point. In listening to this hearing today, I see a distinct difference between what, what the reason for uh, putting into place a drug testing program would be, and perhaps uh, there's a difference. As I gather, concurrent drug testing of employees and people who have access to the President is based on security. That, that they would not want to put the president in the position of someone who w w was presently under drug conditions uh, and that that would be an immediate risk to his person. But always in the, uh, the context of what we're discussing, we have the ma majority that goes back to prior use, even experimental use in college. And there seems to be an attempt to relate that if an individual in their lifetime ever experienced the use of drugs, even experimentally, for all time, they wear the scarlet letter. 
as opposed to those people who are now in a job site and have a responsibility to the taxpayers and a importance of security for the president that we would want to uh, in some way stop that type of individual. And as I understand the testimony today, uh, that in the course of the entire Clinton administration, no employee that was hired or came under the Clinton administration has ever been dis dismissed because of drug, never tested drug positive while on the job in that secure complex of the White House. Only on two occasions were employees ever dismissed in the random sample that does 14 percent a year in testing, and both of those employees had been appointed by a previous Bush administration. That takes care of the security problem. But I always hear my friends on the other side, Mr. Burton, and even the chairman of the subcommittee, suggest that there is a record of disclosure by employees that may be working in the past or in the present at the White House that at some time in prior conditions of life they had experimented with drugs, and the implication being there, that should disqualify them. That scarlet letter should be applied. And what I understand from the testimony of the first panel, and Mr. Reeder, that no, everything is looked at in context. Is there a security risk to the President? Is there a drug use on the job? And does that cause a conflict or a risk of security? And then, whether or not there's a punishment factor out there because of any one singular time in your life you may have experimented with drugs, that that does not for all time bar you from working in the White House. I think that's the right measure. I think that's standard on a case-by-case -case method. And I may say, Mr. Chairman, that to the best of my recollections, a good portion of the House of Representatives, a good portion of the United States Senate, and I know for certain by admission on national television, the Speaker of this House, if we use the criteria the experimentation of drugs at any time in your life would disqualify you from public service of the highest order, they would not be here. And I think it's very important to send a message now to these very important people in the executive branch of this government and the highest office of the President that this Congress now has examined into this issue. We discover that we have in place one of the most comprehensive programs for drug testing and that the security of the President is not at risk nor is the national security of the United States at risk by all evidence that's on the record. And that yes, they examine into and recognize that there are factors in life where someone may have experimented with drugs in a very early portion of life. But these people are no different than the Speaker of the House, the members of the House of Representatives, the members of the Senate, and members of the Supreme Court that sit today. And that we as an enlightened society recognize that we have cast out the scarlet letter and it should remain out of government in the future so that competent people can have had a mistake in their past but still rise to the level of public service because of their incredible abilities and their proven security and their contribution to this government. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, let me just uh, note for the record uh, that uh, uh, it's been characterized that these were experimental uh, use in someone's youth or in college days and that that should not permanently disbar you from service in the federal government. And I would agree with that. I mean, I think that is, uh, that should not be a permanent bar. But we have been advised with the Secret Service that the people who were involved in this particular program, the White House program, the 21 individuals, have had, had a record of using drugs within one to two years of their application for service in the White House before starting at the White House. So that is not, uh, you know, long distance, long past uh, usage, uh, the follies of one youth. I mean, that was fairly contemporaneous usage that was being uh, identified, and that's why the program was started. I would note that given that kind of usage uh, within one to two years would not qualify any of those individuals for employment in the FBI or in the Secret Service. So I think there is a, there is a differentiation here in, in what we're talking about. Uh, Mr. Reeder, we want to uh, express our appreciation to you for your testimony here today. We hope that you will be able to provide us uh, some of the information that we requested for the record. Will do. And with that, uh, the committee stands adjourned. Thank you.